Hello, Prof. Good afternoon. Hi, hi, Mercy. Mercy, I'm going to make you host. Okay. And um, I'm hoping you can then know how to make uh, breakout rooms. Do you know how mm -hmm. to do that? Uh, yes, I, I believe I do here. I think um, let's go. Um, let me remember. At the Mm. Yeah, other and then participants. Breakout room. We'll start uh, with the mm. other. Oh, let me. Room. Should I enable waiting room for now? Um, you can actually. That might be easier, and then you can disable it uh, as you start. Okay, so breakout rooms are in. You can just click that to select it, and then you. You. I think you can. And it's not a need to stress. I think you just have to think about um, the uh, the question of who, how you name the groups. So you just need to name the groups with um, the names of the facilitators we have confirmed. Okay. And then at least, and then the French, you can just put F in or brackets with the two French speaking groups. And then what we need to do is just establish, um, you know, if we tell people to just select themselves, um, that's possible. Um, that might be a way to try it this time, that people go and select it themselves. Okay. So wait, um, where do I enable them from? I think when you do the breakout room, like when uh -huh. you set up the breakout room, you should be able to have functions that allow you to sort of choose either that you develop them or you, you arrange them, or if you um, allow it automatically, et cetera, et cetera. Let's see if I can get another computer, just get another account that I can just check. Hang on. All right. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Alex. Hello. Hi. How are you? Merci. I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? I'm fine. Ready for this workshop. <laughs> uh, awesome. Thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Hi. Mercy, I just wanted to ask, as a facilitator, are there specific questions we are supposed to be asking within the discussion group or anything? So if you look at the concept note, um, there's a place for a question. So there's one question that the, the participants are going to answer. So you're just going to be leading the discussion around that just to stimulate discussion. For example, um, you, you're going to have everyone in the room introduce themselves and just a short introduction, um, who they are, which country they're from, and um, what field they work in. And then after that, you can introduce the questions then have, or you can ask the, the participants to either have a repertoire who will report back the findings, or you can choose to do it yourself. Someone will be writing down what you, the main points of the discussion. So after that, now you just go from person to person around the room. Um, I usually prefer doing that so that um, everybody can, can have a chance to speak up. So just uh, giving points on the on the on the question that has been asked, and I think the question for us is on. Just give me a minute to read it out for you. So, okay. so the question for the on discussion uh, for discussion today is um, how best can we use reviewing practice models? Uh, Oh no, that's a panel, a panel question, sorry. Uh, for the group question, what are the PHC practice model issues for universal health coverage in Africa? And how can we use emerging PHC practice models to support development? Okay, 
perfect. Thank yes. you very much. Yeah, so you read out the question to the participants and then from there just guide the discussion, prompt them. If someone uh, mentions something that you think uh, prompts more discussion, you can ask them, you know, tell me more about that or tell us more about that or give us an example from your setup, how you do it, you know, such like. So it, for you to just facilitate them and prompt them to speak and uh, really drive the discussion. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Uh -huh, prof. Yes, sorry, Mercy. I just took the reclaim the host just to check what what was happening. I realize okay. now that I've actually not set up the Zoom meeting properly to include breakout rooms, and that's yeah, that's what I was I'm, looking for them. Yeah, so that's <laughs> why you are stuck. Uh, I think we probably going to have to just go with having a breakout. I mean, a discussion in the broader meeting, and get people's okay. comments, etc. So let's just go with it like that. So right. we run it as one big workshop and just go for it like that. I think the problem will be is if I have to close the meeting, I'm going to have a challenge um, to, to, to run this. I also think I have a challenge in that I haven't set up uh, even the interpretation, Alexandra. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that properly. So I think what happened is I moved from the Afro PHC, I mean, the uh, Wonka Africa account to the if Afro PHC account. And I didn't do some background stuff that I'd done before on the Afro and the Wonka one. And that's mm -hmm. why I just jumped in and set it up, not realizing I had not done some setting issues sorted out. And okay. uh, anyway, sorry about that. So I think let's just go with it. <clears throat> I think that the interpretation might not work now because we haven't got that. And I, I can't edit the meeting settings. Mm -hmm. Okay. But Alex, I'm not sure. Uh, it probably is going to mean that we're going to have to just go with it. Um, what we can do is, is tell people who want to speak French to speak French and then in the discussion, but you won't be here as well. You're only going to be here for the first hour. So I think, Alex, I hope you don't understand um, that, that we won't be able to do the interpretation because of my mistake. Is that all it's right? Okay. It's okay. It's I mean, okay. no worries for me. As you far as you can things. arrange, uh, arrange yeah, I'll the first just sort hour. This out. <laughs> Yeah, it was mm -hmm. the beginning and I moved across to a new account. And it's okay. No, up. no worries about me. I'm no sorry problem. that I cannot <laughs> help you yeah. with this first hour. No, that's fine. Um, I also have to, Alex, um, arrange for you to connect with um, uh, somebody who will deal with um, the uh, a, a weekly meeting, which we have for an hour, 3 to 4 p.m. on a Thursday South African time. If you mm -hmm. can just have a look at that um and i will i will send an email to make sure that you're clear about it mm -hmm. does it sure. seem all right mm -hmm. yes you can send me I'll, all the details via I'll email and i'll i'll get in touch with you after no that problem. yeah great thank you very much appreciate that we have thank other people you. joining us so <laughs> okay good luck with this webinar i'm going to yeah. jump on another meeting so <laughs> no thank you very much take care now i think bye bye, take care. bye bye alex bye alex alexandra so mercy i think we it's pretty simpler uh, i think i will sit with you after this go through the the um, concept note and also just bring through um this thing so let me handle it for you so uh the the controls All right, no problem and you just talk and i will do the background stuff until it's my okay. turn to talk, which shouldn't be re should be relatively simple. So I think it will right. be fine for me to do it. So I think we're about four minutes out. I don't see Akan, uh, has Akan speaker. Joined? I don't see Akan on the list. Um, I'm not sure. Danny Gotto, that's a different person. I've, I've uh, allowed in Senkiri, Francoise, Cynthia, um, and Ellie, and I'm waiting for Rich Roberts. Let me just send okay. a quick message to him, um, just to remind him. Hope he hasn't got time. Time's problem. So I had posted also on the WhatsApp group just for the um, facilitators also to join prior to the meeting. Great. I think, uh, let me just quickly go through them uh, that we can be sure we've got everybody. Mm, okay, I've just sent a message. I've got uh, Anbar Ganatra, Ikena Oraku, 
Uh, Eli, Eli, you might be able to recognize the names. Fina, uh, Grace Danda, Danny Gotto, Ruby Kodom, Wamala, uh, Lynn Hammer, Atia, or most of there's uh, Rich Roberts is joining us. Okay. I'll uh, share his presentation first. Here we go. Hi, Rich. Hi, Richard. Hi, good, glad to have you here. I'm gonna open your presentation. Yeah. I can share it, or if you want to share, if you can share, let me just double check that that's possible because we didn't set things properly on this first meeting. Um, yeah, I'll share it for you if you don't mind. I didn't allow you to, you know, have good, just settings were not right. So will that be all right um, for you, Richard? Just tell me next and I'll move your slides. Don't worry about sharing on your side because I think I didn't do the so overall setup on the account properly and some little issues, um, I haven't got them right. So I'll fix them up. But um, I will I have put up the, web, the, the slides on the website and, um, and I'll sort of present it from my side. So let me just share it for you and you don't need to worry too much. Yep. Okay. Right. What we'll do is uh, just for everybody, what we'll do is uh, if you can just put your video off for now and maybe mute yourself, we'll just start after uh, just with, uh, with something at the beginning. Um, that's just the um, slide, this thing. And we'll, we'll give it about, a, about 30 seconds to a minute and I'll just admit all. And from there, Mercy will start and she'll introduce us and we'll do the presentations and then she'll manage the um, the question and answer session. And then we'll just have a group discussion going on after that. So as soon as you feel you need to leave by the end of the hour, which um, feel free to do that. Um, but I think we'll, we'll end it at a point where you can leave. And I think that should be fine. Does that seem all right? Okay, um, I'll just quickly allow him everyone in and we can just mute ourselves and stop video. Over to you, Mercy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our very first workshop, Afro-PHC workshop um, uh, this year. Um, so uh, today we are going to look at exploring PHC team practice models for UHC. And in our panel today, we have a wealth of experience um, so I'm going to introduce our two panelists today. Uh, sorry, first of all, I've not introduced myself. I'm Dr. Masi Wanjala, I'm a family medicine resident from Kenya and part of the Afro-PHC uh, coordinating team. 
So today we have with us uh, Professor uh, Richard Roberts, who is a professor uh, emeritus and a past chair in the Department of uh, Family Medicine at the University of Wisconsin in USA. He's a family physician and an attorney also, and he has practiced for 35 years in rural communities, providing full scope family medicine services, including ambulatory, hospice, hospital, maternity and surgical care. He has served as a president of the Wonka, that is a World Association of uh, Family Doctors, and also the American Academy of Family Physicians. His academic focus is on quality and safety, including the development of tools such as guidelines. He has consulted and taught on uh, primary care redesign and also health system reform in more than 100 countries. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Richard Roberts. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. And we also have with us Prof. Uh, Shabir uh, Mosa, who is the executive coordinator for AfroPHC. He's a family physician with an MBA and a PhD. He has extensive experience in rural and general practice and the development of family medicine and primary care services in both rural and urban district health services in South Africa and across Africa also. Um, he is uh, also deeply involved in development and research around uh, family medicine and community-oriented primary uh, health care in Johannesburg, uh, Gauteng, and Africa. He, he is also the president of, um, of, uh, of the African uh, division of Wonka and the executive co coordinator of AfroPHC, the African Forum for Primary Health Care, bringing African PHC team uh, leaders together to advocate for PHC and UHC. It's a pleasure to have you with us today, uh, Prof. Uh, Shabir. So um, we are going to go ahead and uh, to the presentations where we'll have Prof. Re uh, Richards reflect on primary health care models. Um, Prof. Richards, welcome. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mercy. I, I hope my audio is uh, adequate. Does it sound OK? Perfect. Great, thank you. It's having a little trouble at first. Uh, well, it's a real pleasure to visit with you today. And the charge that uh, Prof. Shabir gave me was to try to provide some of the new models that we're seeing in the United States, but also a bit of a global perspective. And I'll do my best to do both. And I also hope to be a little bit provocative. I want to challenge some of our conventional thinking on this because I think, uh, if anything, the COVID pandemic has uh, shined a very harsh light on all of our health systems and revealed in many ways how inadequate uh, every healthcare system around the world is. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are four trends that I see at the global level that are affecting, I think, every country and every health system, though to varying degrees, depending on where you are. The first is that there's been a distinct shift in the source of morbidity and mortality from communicable or infectious to chronic disease, or what the World Health Organization calls non-communicable disease, NCD. Uh, in, in every country now, uh, it's the chronic diseases, cardiovascular, respiratory, cancer that uh, are the major sources of death. It's not to say that infectious diseases have gone away. We, we've lived that through the last two years, but at, uh, at, a, at a population level, that's those chronic diseases have become the most important in terms of mortality. There's also been a bit of a shift from what I would call a focus on personal health to more population health. Guidelines are developed with populations of patients in mind, for example. Uh, those that pay for care are insisting more and more that the care that they're getting is valued. And that's a very uh, challenging idea to work through because what one person may value in terms of their health care, uh, another person may think is not worth very much. But to the extent that uh, they can, the funders and payers of health care are wanting more and better evidence that what's being done uh, for patients is indeed helping them. And then lastly, there's a drift toward what I would call market consolidation. Now, in countries that have a completely government-run healthcare system, uh, that becomes a little bit of an oxymoron because the government is the single um, employer or, or owner of healthcare services. But in most countries, there's usually a blend of 
private and public. And what one finds, especially on the private side, is that you know a single-handed practice gets bought up by a group practice, which gets bought up by a health system, and on and on it grows. Next slide, please. Um, another, I think, important development over the last decade has been the idea of the social determinants of health. Um, healthcare is more than just about genes and amino acids and um, various things that we can test for in, in you know, test tubes and un look under microscopes. It also, health also involves uh, the conditions uh, that people are born in and live in, and that's affected greatly by uh, the place that they have in society, how much power they have, social power, as well as the resources. Next slide. In the United States, uh, primary care uh, gets about three to 4% of overall health spending. And we've been struggling with uh, how to make primary care more visible and important, even though more than half of all the visits in the healthcare system are still to primary care. Uh, one of the ideas that's been developed has been this notion of uh, high performing primary care uh, groups or practices. And a professor named Tom Bodenheimer, who's at the University of California in San Francisco, has actually studied in about 30 or 40 different practices. And these are practices that range from a small number of doctors to a very large number, academic practices, rural in underserved areas and so on. Um, and, and he's identified uh, at least 10 different traits or attributes that he finds consistently in the high performing practices. And I'll touch on these a little bit more. But the reason I brought this slide up in particular is because the uh, URL that's listed there, HTTPS CEPC.UCSF.edu, the CEPC is the Center for Excellence in Primary Care. And there are a lot of um, useful tools, I think, as people think about their practices and what they might do differently uh, that you can uh, turn to at no cost. And so that's a resource you might find valuable. Thank you. Next slide, please. Now, uh, if we think back to the origins of uh, the, the physician and people that provide health services to others, we had uh, folks like Hippocrates advising us uh, a couple thousand years ago that it's more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. And one wonders how we went from that very person-centered or focused idea of health and healthcare to the assembly line that you see in the right lower corner of the slide where uh, now healthcare is viewed as, you know, people just going down an assembly line with different specialists looking them over. Next slide, please. Um, and the idea of community has really been in many ways um, drawn out or sucked out of, <laughs> out of uh, healthcare in the swing toward personal healthcare that was going on for the last 50 years. Uh, and, and yet when I started this rural practice through the University of Wisconsin uh, in a rural village, um, one of the things we wanted to do was to engage the community more effectively and try to create an environment or a climate of health locally. And so this is actually the first meeting uh, 35 years ago in the village I practiced in Belleville uh, to begin to address this. And uh, what we built this model on uh, was good work that actually had been done originally in Africa by uh, Sydney and Emily Kark, uh, the community-oriented primary care model. And, and actually out of our experiences, along with some others at the time, uh, this book was written that I have there. Uh, but it also reminds me of one important reality about uh, taking care of people, and that's people have very different views of things. So for example, we were able to uh, have medical students help us look at all the sources of morbidity and mortality in our community, in our catchment area. And uh, it, it was pretty clear as it is in most places that cardiovascular disease was the main killer. Uh, and so as we put all these charts and, and uh, dot pin maps up on the wall and had our community advisory people here who came from all different parts of the community, some were farmers, some were 
you know, shopkeepers and so on. Um, we, we then went around and said, okay, well, what project are we going to work on first? And most everyone going around the table said, well, we have to work on heart disease or, you know, blood pressure control, things of that sort. And there was an older woman sitting right next to me who said, uh, the main healthcare problem in, in Belleville is beer cans on my lawn. And we all looked at her like, what? And uh, what she was complaining about was that uh, every Friday evening, many of the teenagers in our community would head up to the big city uh, an hour north and uh, be drinking alcohol and throwing their beer cans out onto her front yard. And, uh, and what was interesting is that when we looked at our mortality data in a slightly different way, which was to say not just how many people died of heart disease or car crashes due to alcohol, it turned out that alcohol was the largest source of mortality if you used productive years life lost uh, as the main measure of mortality, which it, many times we, we need to do because young people are supposed to live a lot longer. So it was uh, something that taught me about the reality of this. Now, <laughs> we said, okay, well, let's try to tackle alcohol. And that proved to be a real challenge because in the state that I live in, Wisconsin, uh, we have, we're the number one state for having alcohol-related uh, problems. And uh, the definition of a small town in my state is at a four-corner stop, you'll find uh, three pubs and a church. And to take that lobbying on to uh, get the uh, liquor and alcohol industry to change their ways what proved uh, really difficult. And so we ended up doing a project on, on weight loss and on uh, cardiovascular disease first, only to later after we'd gotten more uh, trust and, and recognition built up in the community, be able to go back to cardiovascular, uh, to uh, alcohol related disease. Next slide, please. Uh, the changing of healthcare systems around the world uh, reflect many of the same uh, issues. Um, one of the things I like to say to primary care people is uh, you're never going to have enough. And, and that's true to systems level. It's true to primary care level. There are never going to be enough doctors, never going to be enough nurses, never going to be enough whatever you think you need. That's just the reality of it because in many ways, the demand for healthcare services is almost infinite. It's almost as though each of us expects our own personal doctor, personal nurse uh, that takes care of no one else. So there is this shortage and the shortage is growing. Um, second is that there's particular geographic areas where the, the lack of access is worse, uh, rural areas, obviously, but even in inner cities. And sometimes the access there may not be a matter of distance. It may be a matter of transport. How do I get from where I live or work to where the care is? Uh, the care is quite expensive in many countries, especially in mine, as I'll show you. Uh, and the care, because of that assembly line idea, has become increasingly depersonalized, some people feel, and more fragmented. Next slide. Um, we know that the primary care has a huge effect uh, on how people do. Uh, their health is rated better, the disparities between people, and even income inequality are less when you have a primary care-based system. Next slide, please. And we, so we know that ultimately people do better with primary care. Next slide. Now, one thing I'd like you to think about is a slightly different way of looking at what primary care is. Uh, many times people think, and certainly governments think, that primary care is a set of services you provide to people. You provide them first access, you coordinate care, you take care of typically uh, less complex conditions. And I think that's actually untrue. I think that we in primary care take care of the most complex problems because we will see a condition like cancer very early before the specialists uh, are ever able to see it. And we see it very late after the specialists have said there's nothing more we can do. The definition I prefer to think of for primary care is that it's a complex adaptive system that aims to know the person, foster trust, and advance health through customized personal care. Just think uh, about the difficulties we've had getting people vaccinated around the world. Sometimes it's because of a vaccine availability, but many times it's because of vaccine hesitancy. And that we think has a lot to do with trust. And one of the ironies in the United States, which had plenty of vaccine available, is that only about uh, two thirds of the population, adult population, sought out vaccination. My view, my argument as to why that is, is that most vaccinations have been given historically in the primary care setting. And now suddenly government's setting up 
you know, huge vaccine uh, clinics in, in football stadiums uh, where they don't know who's giving them the vaccine. They, there's no one they can really talk to about it. They don't have trust in that system. Next slide, please. Uh, and when we focus on primary care and some of the trends there, uh, when you look at the professionals, for example, it, primary care was typically the general doctor just out of uh, medical school with little or no postgraduate training. And then we became more subspecialized or specialized into primary care as either family doctors or in some countries, general internal medicine, general pediatrics. And now we've increasingly shifted toward what I would call a primary health care team. Um, thinking about everyone that's working with us. Uh, the same thing for how you get into the system. It used to be you just showed up, uh, but now increasingly, especially when a population is capitated, you're getting paid for a population of people and expected to keep them well. You're, you're expected in primary care to perform a gatekeeper role to keep people um, you know, from overutilizing services. Uh, but I think a better word, if you're talking about things like that, is what I would call gateway, because there are reasons we have gates. The gates tell us where it's safe to cross uh, along a cliff without falling off the cliff. And in primary care, it's saving people from having things done to them that might be harmful. Um, and our care strategies have shifted from the individual's agenda and, and what we normally do for a problem to what one might call a proactive approach where we're thinking about populations using guidelines or protocols. And the funding has gone in many countries from uh, private, you just paid out of your own pocket to public, now uh, increasingly to a, a mix. So it's interesting to me that many systems sort of tend to drift toward the middle. Uh, some may start as purely government funded and driven. Uh, others may start much more private, but they often tend to come to the middle for reasons that um, I don't understand completely, but that's how it is. Next slide, please. Um, and what we're seeing in practices as a consequence of all of that is that, uh, like in the United States, you might have had a single-handed or solo, uh, let's say, family doctor who then uh, either joins or gets bought by a single specialty group of more family doctors. Um, you might find them working in a community health center, which in the U.S. are more uh, government-funded and tended historically to treat more of the marginalized or disadvantaged. Uh, the group may be bought by a multi-specialty group where it's no longer just primary care physicians, but a range of other uh, doctors as well, uh, you know, neurologists and surgeons and whatever. And then the big group gets bought by a hospital, and then the hospital gets bought by other hospitals to become a system. And uh, I think there's this notion that bigger is better. And uh, what we're finding more recently is bigger is just bigger. And uh, many times the quality can go down because the care is not as personalized, it becomes more assembly line, and it becomes more expensive because these big groups begin to exert monopolistic power and uh, they can charge whatever they want. And so this has been uh, a, a very recent concern uh, that's called into question the, the value of these large, large groups and systems that are formed. I mean, we have some groups where they're taking care of as many patients as you find for an entire country. The Kaiser Permanente, uh, system uh, takes care of 20 million people. It's got like 10,000 doctors. Um, and that's just one of, you know, 50 that are huge. Um, and, and many do a very good job, but there are questions about whether they drive overutilization, because after all, we have to keep all the other people that work for our group and fully employed and occupied, that sort of thing. Next slide, please. And how we're paying for care uh, is shifting in the U.S. as well. As I say, initially was uh, to a great extent out of pocket or patient would pay. Uh, now upwards of uh, 85 to 90%, depending on the data you read, of Americans have health care. Much of that as a result of Obamacare, um, where uh, there were subsidies from government to help people purchase private insurance, uh, which is still the dominant form of insurance, but also some that would then go into government insurance programs like Medicare for the older population or people with disabilities or medical assistance for those that are less well off financially. And the way that insurance uh, tends to pay varies. Uh, some plans you get paid on a fee for service basis. So there, the more you do, the more you earn. Uh, others, you get paid on a capitation basis where the less you do, the more you keep. Um, and I think many uh, family doctors in particular have grown so frustrated with this uh, increasingly bureaucratic feeling uh, and large, oppressive uh, kind of healthcare funding, 
system have decided to break away. The estimates are right now about maybe 10% of the 100,000 plus family doctors are now doing what's called direct primary care, where the patient pays a monthly fee, like a capitation fee to the doctor, to the practice, and gets all their primary care. And there are no additional bills for anything else that the primary care uh, doctor would do. And then the patient usually buys a much less expensive uh, plan that covers them for hospital or catastrophic events, which are much less often, much less frequent than the care they would be routinely getting in primary care. Next slide. And how the doctors get paid or other professionals in the practice. Uh, there's a variety of strategies. You can get paid based on productivity, which is what you charge your bill. And we use something called relative value units to try to measure, you know, it's doing this kind of brain surgery worth as much as doing uh, this kind of counseling of a patient with a mental health problem. Um, you can get paid based also on performance where you're being measured on your quality and on your patient satisfaction. You may get just a salary or you may get a blended or combination of these different approaches. My own view, looking especially at places like Norway, is the blended approach probably works best. So the Norwegian family doctor gets a fixed amount per each patient each month. And that really helps to provide a lot of the infrastructure for the practice. It helps to make sure the rent gets paid, the staff gets paid. Uh, but then there uh, is a productivity uh, or fee for service payment for things that the government wants the family doctors to be doing more of. And that's kind of a smart way to do it. So if you want more immunizations, you pay the doctor more because you know it's going to take them more time to talk people into immunizations if they're reluctant or hesitant, uh, but that does everybody well because then more immunizations result because the doctors are able to get paid uh, adequately for their time and getting people to uh, undergo immunization. Next slide. So some of the specifics uh, data-wise of the U.S. health system and, and the United States itself. So we have 330 million people, about 22 million or 14% of the population work in healthcare. Uh, it's the single largest uh, employment sector in the United States. A uh, little over 1 million of those healthcare workers are physicians and not quite 4 million of those workers are nurses. We spend, and this always makes me take a big breath, 4.1 trillion US dollars or about $12,500 per person per year. And it now represents almost 20% of our gross domestic product spending. So it's the single largest sector in our economy and it has more people working in it than any other part of the economy. And it, when people from other countries say to me, why don't you fix your system? I have two answers to that. What I say to them is for the money we spend, the United States could have the world's best healthcare system if only we had a system. <laughs> we have all these different scattered approaches uh, that I've laid out for you uh, all over the country. That's problem number one. And problem number two is when there's so many people getting paid to be in healthcare and so much money being paid, you think it's easy to change that? Uh, people are very reluctant to make any change when the goose is laying golden eggs. Next slide. So some final thoughts, as you think about how you might wanna redesign your practice or your community's local healthcare environment or at a national or even international level. Uh, the first thing I would say to you, having looked at lots of ways of doing things is that perfect does not exist. And so don't torture yourself. Now, those of us in academia, I think, have uh, in some ways actually added to the problem of this because we every now and again come up with some new way of doing things and we give it a fancy name or label. And if you just do it this way, you'll have a perfect practice. Well, that's not true. It does not exist. Second thing I would say to you is it's always about taking care of people. And so if your practice and if your, your health systems uh, overall organizational strategy or goal is to be person-centered, that the person receiving the services is, is who we're really trying to please, uh, it's, you'll be more likely to get it right. The third is to engage family and community because many times they can help you get things done that are uh, not really possible one patient at a time in the clinic or practice site. Um, and, and more importantly, they often have uh, very innovative ways of getting things done. Um, one of the things I've said to my African friends whenever I visit and spend a little time in their practice is because of resource limitations, people have to be more creative. And there are often really creative approaches that come out of that, um, that resource limit uh, that the rest of the world would benefit from. 
Uh, fourthly is measure what you do to the extent you can. Don't turn these into research projects, but measure what you do so that you can then compare to see if what you changed made things better or not. And lastly, make sure to take care of yourself and each other. We've seen one out of five nurses and doctors in the United States now take early retirement uh, or just leave medicine or nursing uh, during the, the two years of the pandemic. Now, you know, many of them were further along in their careers and that, that was a decision they were gonna be making not, not too long in the future anyway. But for many, it's just, we're tired, we're burned out, we can't take it anymore. And, and that's very disheartening to hear. Next slide. So those are my comments just to kind of uh, give you at least my overall view of the global state of healthcare and primary care. And uh, let me turn it back to you, Mercy, and keep us moving along. Mercy, you may want to unmute yourself. I'm not hearing you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Roberts, for that wonderful presentation. I love how you have brought um, the essence of primary care back to light, the issue of person-centeredness, and especially the element of trust. Do we trust our system? So thank you so much for that. For those who've joined a bit late, Prof. Roberts is a professor emeritus and a past chair of the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Wisconsin, USA. And he has a wealth of experience, 35 years practicing as a family physician, working with our primary healthcare systems and redesigning them. So um, if you have any questions for him, uh, please type them in in the chat or send them directly to me. After the presentations, we will have a session where you'll be able to engage with him. Next, we have uh, Prof. Shabir Mo uh, Mosa, who is the uh, executive coordinator and also uh, of uh, Afro PHC, and also the the president of uh, past president of um, Afri um, Wonka Africa region. So, uh, Prof. Shabir will be uh, presenting. Uh, on PHC team practices models for UHC Africa on he will be presenting on his experience with this in um, South Africa and the question that the two panelists today are trying to answer is how best can we use reviewing practice uh, model support primary health care and teamwork for universal health coverage in Africa so that's the question we're answering today uh, uh, Prof Shabir over to you welcome no, thank you very much, Mercy, and I do apologize uh, to all the participants. Um, our plan um, for having breakout rooms has been confounded partly because I didn't set up the new Afro PHC account very well, and um, so we're going to have to just carry on in a big group discussion. Um, but I think that um, we'll we'll just allow everyone to unmute themselves. I've also got some little issues with the way I've set it up otherwise. So let me dig in. Uh, and thank you, Prof. Uh, uh, R R Richard Roberts. I think he's provided a good backdrop. Um, some of the issues that I'm going to raise, he's mentioned already. And I think the key, uh, this is a very important discussion um, because of the need for us to develop a document um, in, uh, in for the Afro PHC on how we can build a primary health care team um, for UHC in Africa and, and getting an idea of the way primary care is organized at a local level is actually quite important and it is linked to the broader uh, conversation of systems um, as has been pointed out. I think that um, you know we, we really do need to appreciate in Africa that we have got a, a problem of neocolonialism, colonialism that has left the continent um, uh, very, very um, bereft of its leadership. I think the problem is it had leadership in the 1950s with the independence, but quickly fell in with the colonialist view on how to sort of structure the economies and priorities, etc. And I think it's only now since the AU has been formed in 2000 that we are breaking free of the attitude that, you know, everything West is best. Um, I think that um, the history of primary health care has been really poor since the 1978 uh, Maata Declaration. There have been just a few reports on um, you know, primary health care and the way in which it should function. And a lot of it was based on uh, trying to deal with priority health programs where the Alma Ata Declaration of Comprehensive Primary Health Care was subverted by this 
uh, you know, the big institutions like UNICEF and UNAIDS, which push an idea of selective primary health care and has dominated the agenda. Even the Uga Dugu Declaration in 2008 sort of spoke to the need to use these verticalized programs um, to achieve universal coverage. But I think that since... Um, since 2017, and these are some of the reports that have emerged since 2017, 18, 19, the, the, there's a growing shift to defining uh, primary health care um, away from that, that dominating, fragmenting uh, ethos and saying that we really do need very strongly integrated primary health care. Um, and in line with the uh, World Health Report 2008, um, the Astana Declaration 2018, um, for, to say that we need person-centered care and that the systems need to rearrange themselves. And a lot of that sort of change needs to be moving away from the idea that the public service is the only intervention of governments to say that they need to think of the public and private as, as, the, uh, as being uh, you know, custodians of the entire health system um, and that we need to look at very strong service delivery programs that produce patient-centered care, the importance of including the public uh, health care and primary care uh, into a mixture that translates on the ground. Um, and these are you know, important ideas that are now filtering in um, to documents, but it still struggles with the fact that uh, even in the last report recently, um, the sort of thinking in um, WHO has been around the building blocks, the six building blocks, very much dominated by the um, public health, uh, you know, uh, thinking, uh, and 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 it's recognized even in WHO documents, and you see that in the slides. I've got some references in the notes uh, where the um, uh, it's been acknowledged that that these building blocks actually perpetuate fragmentation. They do not sit and think through how we integrate very well. So I was a, a commissioner in the development of the 2021 a, a HIKE report, which is the Africa Health Agenda International Conference, a commission that was set up and produced a report. And it basically went through four elements uh, just published last year um, and re, um, re sort of launched a few weeks ago, uh, where we talk about performance of African primary health care uh, or health uh, the challenges, opportunities, and then some recommendations. And I'm going to go through them as a useful document, but also an assimilation of the issues that I think um, um, Rich talked about at a US level. Coverage in Africa is really poor. Um, we even have serious financial risk protection with one in 10 people actually, um, actually being thrown into poverty as a result of some health expenditure during the year. And health outcomes are improving. Um, but it is still globally an outside outlier. Um, so we don't have the, we have not caught up with the rest of the world, even though we are improving some. And I think the, the challenges that have been recognized in the report, and I think that this has been really um, researched with some strong uh, evidence base for it that you can find in the report, um, that really we still suffer the context I've mentioned of, of colon colonization, neo-colonial influence. We have not had enough economic growth and in fact, we still struggle with the high, high dependency rate, um, that they're more unemployed than employed. And, the, and, and so, um, you know, that is not strong enough for our uh, society. Um, political instability and wars, although less, is still a feature. And I think a rising problem is urbanization, big, huge, unplanned cities and climate change. Um, they also, the system itself of health being very poorly managed with really weak governance and accountability. Of course, there's a high disease burden and communities don't trust and own the health systems. And of course, we have some difficult challenging societal norms that I think are difficult to manage, um, but uh, represent some of the challenges in Africa. But Africa is not a basket case. In fact, we have lots of opportunities and we need to appreciate them and take advantage of them. I mean, the economic trajectory is in fact one that we all should be recognizing that uh, the fastest growth across the globe in the last 10 years pre-COVID has been actually in Africa. The AU has become very pro-people and is uh, supporting that uh, widely. And I think that's building up much more demo democratic government. I think an example of this kind of very progressive approach is the Africa free trade area, which may create the largest block, free trade block in the world. 
um, uh, you know, and, and I think allows us to exchange with each other without the costs associated of cross-country trade. I think we need to see our traditional healthcare uh, network as, as a value. Um, there is strong political commitment, although that is um, often challenged by, by, you know, sometimes elites as well as foreign, foreign influence, foreign agendas. Um, and then we, we also must recognize that we have a very young population. And whilst that might be a challenge with huge challenges now, they represent a long uh, timeline of very productive adults. And I think that is an economic value, um, is human capital. We also must appreciate that in Africa, we do have a developed private sector, especially in health. And it is, whilst it is, in fact, it contributes a large amount of health spend within many countries. And we know that despite the fact that our governments don't deal with them or actually take them into account. Um, and we also have growing innovation, you know, sort of ecosystems, uh, especially with IT. And I think we have a strong civil society and very competent health professionals. Uh, I think the biggest problem in our countries right now is not enough respect for that innovative health professional um, that we have. And I think that with the COVID, there's been a sort of a sense that, that people have tried to be, to be a, 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 you know, a, a look sideways and they've, they've actually thought laterally and brought in health professionals, the private sector and been looking at innovative solutions. So the recommendations that come, and I'm trying to be brief about these, there's a lot more detail. Uh, I think this was one of the key challenges in our discourse. It was very easy for the key recommendation to be very driven by, towards the financial elements. And in fact, there was a strong acknowledgement of the whole group that we need to talk to things from a non-financial perspective first and prioritize that. And, and it was quite an achievement to be able to get this clarity from that report that really we need to get um, health systems reoriented towards population health needs, preventive promotive health. And I think that is there and we need to just and, you know, and enhance that idea and make sure governments appreciate that. And I think the second one was to prioritize strength in primary health care. Again, political commitment is there, but to speak uh, you know, in the, the leader of the panel, the commission was an economist. So I think it, it hopefully has strength across, not just in health, but across the entire government to say primary health care matters. Um, and I, we actually said that we really need to move towards priorities, pri priorities prioritizing health, primary health care, but also making health in all policies as a part of the overall government priorities. Um, and that they should see this as an important social project and invest and strengthen um, you know, investments in primary health care delivery. We particularly said that they need to strengthen facilities, which I think is a resource problem, but importantly, and I've highlighted it, they need to strengthen primary health care service delivery with flexi flexible, non-hierarchical, multidisciplinary teams. And it's very much what has been said by uh, Rich that you know, the, we're moving away from doctors towards multidisciplinary teams. But in Africa, we're moving away from nurses and only and community health workers only towards teams. And we need to find the right mix. And of course, that is the key problem. What is the right kind of mix? Um, but the point is that we, it's not a either or, you know, it's not either doctor or nurse. It's about that the mix actually matters. And that is really a key, key question we need to be addressing and emphasizing to our, uh, you know, leaders in advocacy. I think the problem is that the, ma the, the managers are looking for some one cater as a quick fix and it's not going to happen. Um, I think that implementing integrated service delivery models is really dependent very, very strongly on the way in which it is structured by governments and the way in which it actually is contracted and supported financially. And I think we'll come to that because that's really a key question which we need to move towards. How do we actually find ways to get that? There were other you know, recommendations, and I'm very brief about it, that we need to improve the health system inputs, the quality of health care, and the technologies around it. And that key to that is financing, that we not only increase domestic finance, and I think that is part of the problem, but that in fact, even aid funding needs to be brought to uh, account as to exactly how they are coming through and being used in country, or the fact that they need to be raised uh, globally. But the important thing is that there needs to be pooling uh, at, a, at a national level in a way that, that allows 
um, risk to be shared much more broadly across the country. Um, for rich to actually contribute and poor to contribute marginally less, but for the benefits to accrue more to the poor. And I think that what we have in many African countries is very fragmented pooling of financing across. And this is a major uh, problem that needs to be addressed and is becoming a change problem in many African countries in setting up UHC. I think a lot of African countries are actually setting up strategic purchasing and toying around with some of the elements that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and, um, and I think that there are other issues as well uh, within the financing that need to be dealt with. And this relates to government broadly in terms of accountability and governance, uh, where we need to actually build in you know, this cross-cutting uh, approach, like I said, health in all policy, but also to leverage public-private partnerships and strengthen community participation. So I think this is uh, the kind of backdrop of um, you know, the sort of African view, the, 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 where we are at. And I think, unfortunately, this discourse around the Ahaik report is not very evident, not strongly enough in the WHO Afro discourse. And we need to work with partners in Afro PHC to bring that discussion to bear on the discourse at WHO Afro and to provide them some sort of guidance um, in saying, listen, this is what you should be ad uh, advocating to different governments in Africa um, and not just using the sort of traditional building blocks and, and just pushing a line. And at the moment, all they're doing is saying, let's just share best practice, um, you know, almost at an impasse of what is actually considered best practice. Um, I think that, like Rich has mentioned, I'm going to just mention this, that there are different payment systems. And in Africa, we're very familiar in the public service with budgets and salaries. And I think there's a problem with that in that it, it, you know, it makes a very unresponsive health system. I mean, if you're there and you're receiving a budget or a salary, you know the boss is above you. Many a times you don't even get to taste that budget. You know, if you've got 110 million to your budget, to your facility, you actually only have a disposable 5,000 rand or equivalent. And I mean, that doesn't mean you have the money, but it's just a paper exercise often. So we need to, and, and when you're looking at getting something or making anything change, you look above. And so the managers are the bosses. Whereas the patient counts for nothing. So you just push the queue and that's really the other, the problem in the public service across Africa. And in the private sector, we have an equal problem where most of the private sector is very unregulated, even where there are systems like in South Africa, where they might try to regulate the private sector, they're struggling to get away from a fee-for-service model. Now, fee-for-service model is very responsive, but in fact, it is very open to abuse with over-servicing. Even patients, they, you know, they don't know everything. So it's very easy for health providers to manipulate the patient. Um, you know, that's moral hazard to say, oh, you need this or that, or let's be very thorough and let's do X, Y, Z test. And so they can push the cost and make you come repeatedly, only trying to make more illness and not actually to keep you healthy because there's no fee to keep you healthy. So um, the, the, the other systems, and I think performance-based, as has been said, is really about how well do you perform? And it is increasing in parts of Africa. I think there's a performance-based funding that's happening in Rwanda uh, that's proven very useful, but it actually happened on top of a capitation system in Rwanda. And a capitation system is basically where you are paid a fixed fee as a per capita, so per person, per year, or usually it's paid per month or quarter. And that amount comes to you usually adjusted. It's not just a fixed fee. It's adjusted depending on whether you're a female or old or having other morbidities, depending on the data available within the country at country level. So these are just different ways in which payment occurs. Um, and I think just to tell you that Joint Learning Network is a global support system um, for uh, payment systems, uh, supporting Africa quite considerably through Spark, one of our supporting organizations. And very worthwhile to link up with both these networks and the, the data they provide. I'm going to share with you very quickly um, a proposal that we made to the, uh, you know, that I made. Uh, I was called upon as a consultant by the National Treasury in South Africa, which, which is actually not the same as the National Department of Health. But the National Treasury is not happy with the Department of Health's approach to the National Health Insurance, its universal health approaches, and they wanted to look at how the universal coverage approach would be looking at bringing in the private sector. And so I was tasked to develop a contract for the private sector. And in that engagement, 
essentially we said, you know, it can't be that we create two different types of contracts. And so we, we tried to think it through for the entire system. Uh, so at the moment, I'm going to share with you in two slides, what is the sort of overall thinking in, Af in, in South Africa? And it's not very different uh, to what's going on in the rest of Africa, um, except some sort of slight differences. Essentially, there's the population out there which might um, you know, pay out of pocket to go to a GP or a pharmacy or a specialist, depending. Some few, depending on where they are in Africa, some very few, some uh, like 20%, 16% in South Africa, which use a medical scheme that's a medical aid scheme. They basically go to them, uh, insure, pay the insurance themselves, and then they're covered. Usually employed, employed, employers provide support to that. And then they, again, they go using a fee-for-service system to different providers who are all private. And that is how the system works, supported by private administrators. A system that's fairly well trusted by population. Um, and even the population, which is uh, part of the public service actually uses out of pocket, even though they're not insured, they use the private provider quite substantially. And this is true across Africa. So there may not be a big medical scheme, but there's a growing phenomenon in Africa of use out of pocket of the private sector when the public service doesn't deliver to satisfaction. Well, what happens is, you know, National Treasury actually gets its money from the population. Of course, population, including corporates and other various ways of taxation. So money flows to the National Treasury and usually the National Treasury pass it down to different levels of government. And in South Africa, as is typical across other parts of the world, the first level of government, usually at provincial count, uh, you know, state level, tends to capture most of the funds and decide on how that funding is spent um, and make micromanaging <laughs> districts, which manage, you know, which are particular populations. Uh, in South Africa, this has been very from 500,000 uh, to 5 million. Um, generally, it's supposed to be smaller, but we have large districts in South Africa. But this is supposed to be the closest it gets to the sort of uh, population in terms of responsiveness. Usually these managers are in charge. And as a result, there's very little responsiveness. Most of the decisions get made actually between this and this, um, with most of it actually dominated in South Africa at the provincial level. So communities never get to reach these levels of decision-making and managers themselves are completely captive to that process. So even though there is an engagement with local government as agents and sometimes non-state, um, non-NGOs non to provide care, um, the, the, the NGOs have a better system of management. Local government has some management capacity that brings it closer. But generally, there's a serious problem with the budgetary approach with managing funds. And of course, there's this very deep line, deep chasm between the public and the private. Patients move across. People, you know, these services hardly ever talk to each other. What the government in South Africa is planning to do is basically find a way that yes, money moves across to treasury, the treasury raises it, or the NHI eventually raises funds through treasury, uh, through taxes and other mechanisms um, from various quarters. Uh, but that this money does not go in large amounts through to uh, the National Department of Health or these levels of government. And this is about the principles of universal coverage and, and particularly strategic purchasing, where the idea is to build up a single pool of funding, mostly from the tax uh, funding. Um, and it may be by taking away, for example, some of the uh, state funding of medical schemes, as well as the you know, some of the uh, support government gives to participation medical schemes so that all that funding is located and grows in the national health insurance. Um, and then that becomes the funder uh, purchaser in the South African context. And the idea in the South African context is to build up sub-district levels of purchasing with providers at sub-district level grouped. And that was, that is actually the current model within the public service. And there is a challenge in terms of how the public service is going to relate to the private sector very well. And I think that's some of the big difficulty in the South, pub, South African public service is that it wants to capture this funding, what they think is additional funding, to capture it and continue as before. But in fact, in South Africa, the amount spent by the public service is enormous. We have, in fact, in Gauteng, an amount of... Um, 780 rand being spent uh, per, uh, 
per person per year. Um, in fact, in the country, 1,200 Rand per person per year. Uh, on the average in South Africa, a cost of visit to a public service clinic for even an immunization is 450 Rand. And um, if you know the private sector cost of, of a doctor G consult, the GP consult is about 500 on average. So this is, means that the public service is extremely expensive. And the opportunity is there to actually bring in the GPs um, to be part of this. But a key challenge will be, how is the administration actually uh, managed better? And I think these are some key concerns. We've got about 9,000 GPs in the, public serve, in the private sector but only about a thousand in the private public service. And so if one even brings in um, 6,000 of those uh, doctors from the pub private sector, you'd be able to cover, in fact, 5,000, you'd be able to cover the population based on the model that we discussed with the national treasury, which means that it's very doable given the resources. And of course, how that happens translates um, exactly what are the proposals like needs to be talked through. So a key question across African governments is that, you know, is the shortage of doctors as a usual you know, complaint actually real or not? And we do need, and I think there are certain countries where there is a genuine shortage and it is not as easy to do it. But the key question is, well, then how do you actually think it through? Not necessarily in different way, any different way, but saying, well, then how do we rearrange the population to, to team composition? So it does not need to move away from teamwork, but simply needs to think through um, the sort of ratios that might work in different countries and to look at the cost effectiveness of the different you know, uh, ratios that apply within a country. I think this is another important idea within the PHC performance initiative, which is also talking and, it, and it's, been, it's been coming up in the WHO, but very clearly um, you know, in WHO Global, where we need to actually move towards empanelment of populations, um, which means that a very direct allocation of population to, um, uh, you know, to a team, and that there's a very strong team-based care in the facility, which includes community, and that we really think through very carefully what sort of provider availability, but also competence and motivation. And the way in which they're able to relate to the patient in these various contexts or various elements of contact, uh, first contact, the continuity, comprehensive and coordination to be able to achieve this. And I think that's a key question. And many a times there's a lack of an answer, um, you know, a clear way. This is basically the model that was presented to the National Treasury and the National Department of Health, where in South Africa, there's a considerable amount already of documents that support and are being taken up by different parts of Africa, where there's, for example, norms and standards of facilities and community-based care for clinics and CHCs and larger CHCs. In fact, often this is the CHCs are very not very clear in South Africa but the clinics are very clear with a very for, sort of reductionist, simple approach to saying, here it is. One of the challenges that has been battling, that has been coming up in the facilities at clinic level is despite saying we need, you know, we have these various norms and standards, many a time they struggle to actually deliver this based on the, on the sort of quality or mix of skills within the team uh, that is currently there. And that's why the proposal to the National Treasury was to say, make this team based by with a GP mix, where the, in the current public service, there's a GP or a doctor that is added to it with the increased envelope of resources available, that a community health worker is also an important part of this equation. And where there's a GP, the same problem, he needs to build on a team very much like functions within a clinic's circumstance. And I think this is really a way to say, let's try and build a model that is common to both public and private, and that we in fact only include in that setting an additional element of uh, after hours care, which is quite a big challenge uh, you know, in, in, with access problems in South Africa. But that other elements be left to a progressively adding on additional levels of care once this key element is in fact set in motion to cover the entire population as a first, um, first point or first begin. And in fact, just to point how difficult and challenging it is, just this uh, level of care itself is doable within South Africa by even adding the doctor, one can achieve that. But just adding other elements 
uh, would, for example, add about 30, 30, 25 to 30 percent, just adding a biokinetics, a dietitian, and social worker. Um, just adding dentistry would have doubled the entire cost of this primary care service. So it shows you how difficult it is to add on other levels of service where there is not very little experience with task shifting and task sharing, which is really already available within the public service and partly in the private sector. So I think this just speaks to how important this little, con, you might say, uh, um, you know, uh, juncture of price and uh, human resource availability that makes this a golden opportunity in South Africa, but to progress from that, how difficult that might land up to be. And so this is a pivotal point to begin to build the uh, primary health care. And in fact, the contract which we talked of uh, developing is in fact uh, saying, let's, let's say, set this basis of primary health care as um, a way to build the whole NHI progressively. So in terms of currently uh, the current practice with clinics, and this is really more the public service clinic, is that there is no attachment of any real means to a, to a defined population. It is one of the big problems in, uh, in uh, South Africa and in Africa is that there is no enrollment of the patient person to a clinic to say, I belong to this clinic. Uh, even GPs do not have that kind of uh, uh, you know, a practice in the private as well. So what we are suggesting, what we suggested is to build a community practice where uh, patients from a geography, which is larger than just simply a sort of very small defined geography, for example, the 500,000 district or even the 5 millionth district, any person would be able to enroll into any provider, any clinic or GP that is accredited, would then be able to um, go to uh, go to a provider that's accredited. So any person within there would be able to say, well, let me go to any provider. And of course, the key in some of this would be to start small, but to force the issue that, that all practices actually take on at least 10,000 so that the distribution of the key resource of doctors is actually spread across much more equitably and forces a situation which is current across most of Africa where private GPs are crowded into urban centers. And there is a still strong possibility of this uh, model actually um, helping to change that dynamic of very um, rural, uh, you know, poor access because of doctors in cities. Uh, we also were very wary and said that, you know, there's a, there's a huge push in South Africa for defining every single element of service within uh, private primary care down to the nth degree. And um, you know, that's sort of a pension for someone in high level in the Department of Health. We said, well, that's actually quite, quite idiotic. You cannot just simply reduce primary care to some sort of set of algorithms. It's a very complex space. And in fact, you need to really be taking the current guidelines, narrowing them down and showing those to guide the way in which uh, you know, the team functions with. And that in fact, that is really the consulting that should happen Whatever services guided by the brief norms and standards already in place is more than enough. One just simply needs to guide the clinical behavior and perhaps some of the algorithms at the level of the guidelines that are currently available, which are there for even primary health care nurses, um, as well as doctors to send to specialists. And that, that needs to be worked on better to make it much more predictable. But that's the consulting, which we think can be paid for by capitation, covered by capitation. So any patient can visit a facility once they're enrolled uh, at no cost to themselves. Uh, what we did propose was that medicines, labs, and preventive services can be paid for by a fee for service that can be managed around 20%. And that this in fact is probably more stronger a determinant of the service package than the actual list of services. As long as you've got the mix of people, and that is the key question. How do you get the right mix of people uh, in place? And then we said this needs to be added on with performance outcomes with a very predictable future looking plan, not just sort of muck along every year, but that it sets out a, uh, a plan over the next five years, including electronic health record systems. Uh, and that should be penned at about 10% of the overall budget. And in fact, this was very doable within the current budget available in the public service at the moment. Um, to do this kind of thing. Um, we also said that this can be improved with, for example, what the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK does is look at strengthening guidelines 
uh, performance and in fact can easily be creating that as a basic for medical aid schemes where there's sort of very conflicting um, approach to primary health care or um, uh, you know personal medical benefits around chronic care that's actually quite constrictive at the moment. One of the key things going forward is in fact you know a problem for practices and a study I did in 2011 showed that GPs um, you know, when we did a study with them about what would be the visit rate, they, uh, we estimated three visits per person at 120 for 10,000 people. That in fact, that would be the visits per, per person per day. Um, public, private sector doctors estimate that really in the public, so in the, with, with the patients from South Africa, that the visit rate would be four, six and beyond. But actually in the private sector, the one capitation scheme, it seems to be about four. Well, the key is to find a way to reduce utilization, but actually improve quality. And I actually looked at a work I'd done in community orientation and clinical teamwork in Shawello. And I'm gonna share with you the ideas and a little bit of what we've done to say that you can drive that utilization rate right down uh, based on good practice, which we say said can be included into this contract to be able that behavior. So just to say quickly, it's about clinical teamwork, community orientation, referral support, that the district still has a role, even though it is not a provider any longer, and that this whole thing is allowing us a lot of thinking around how do we innovate. So in terms of cl clinical teamwork, yes, 2000, the doctor might say, well, I can do it myself. And it's quite important because they need to take a bite at it. But quickly, if they work well, they might realize how I can actually drive the utilization down while I improve the quality and then be able to take on every year, uh, every two years, at least 1,000 to build up to at least 6,000 as a minimum. Otherwise, they're out of the system. So that this is just about getting them in. But the key thing is that there needs to be at least a doctor per 10,000, which means that any clinic must have a doctor and the funding must cater to that. Uh, they, we also suggested uh, clinical associates, um, which were, uh, you know, growing prominent, and that's probably some deficit there. It might mean that it's a PHC nurse, and in uh, South Africa, that's possible. Um, in other parts of Africa, they might be different. And also just a nurse per 2,000, which could be a mix of nurses. And that there is also a community health worker per 1,000 which is an important part of it. So all of this needed to be integral to the teamwork and the contract um, and that any team, um, you know, whether a clinic needs to have this to work with and needs to build up. In Shawello, um, you know, we've talked of um, building up uh, um, your COPC. And I think that uh, Sidney and Emily Kark, like Richard said, developed these ideas in the, in the 1940s. And they had two innovations. The one was a community health center which dealt with 30,000 people. And that innovation was actually exactly what we talked of now. Two people, doctors, two doctors, Sidney and Emily Kark, didn't have to do it themselves, providing care to everyone. Through task shifting with the medical aid nurses, they were able to build up medical delivery to the community. And this, in fact, is really something we need to push, that larger population with a team can still achieve it. We just need some doctor involvement to try and build the quality up but these are possibilities even in that setting up to 30,000 with two people, two doctors. Is COPC on the other hand, and this is an assimilation that we've tried to do in Shawello, where we said COPC on the other hand is, is in fact about how do we look after the entire population, not just patients who come in. And certainly Amy Cox said, well, you know, we, we really have to think beyond uh, you know, just providing medical care. We've got to sort of prevent people from coming in for medical care. And I think the key elements that we've seen and try to use as in a very sort of um, uh, systems-based approach, uh, you know, adaptive complex system, where we say, let's just reorient the service that we provide um, to, to think team across the entire uh, population and team across the entire population. So we've got the community health workers very integrated into our primary health care with information around them in our health systems or records. Um, and we think through that, that question of the community and population very strongly in the record keeping system and the team approach. 
uh, the actual community of workers are allocated to every single person who belongs. And in fact, in this setting, they are the key to, to enroll the person into the practice. But in future, it does not need to be, uh, you know, it can be based on their enrollment in the practice that they get it. But I think that this does not to be, you need to be geographic. It can be population as enrolled. And I think this is um, much more responsive to patients because they can choose um, you know, how they move around. But the key is that we need to have that engagement uh, with the, um, you know, the person who is enrolled, even if they do not visit. And I think that could happen even with IT, mobiles and calls, et cetera. So it does not need to be physical visits to homes. But the third element is to engage with key stakeholders, whether it is community or whether it is other uh, you know, elements in sort of intersectoral collaboration. The key is to, is to work with them so that the care is delivered better to that population. And all three of these lead to very strong information which can target our health promotion, usually with the community of workers, but in other ways as well, to provide strong outcomes that actually produce benefits. And this is the model that we've used and that we've actually said that can be managed um, through a contract that can be set up as a single document at nationally uh, that can guide this process across. Where patients are profiled, um, you know, the expectation is the practice is actually profiling and acting, actively managing the panel population, where there's a comprehensive health check for everyone, which is part of a sort of uh, performance management process, and that they engage very sort of simplistically but without sending paperwork up to some other central body, simply by having uh, this on a, on a public website and ensuring that communities have access to this kind of accountability. Um, and then to be able to strengthen referral support, because not only is the risk of access denied to patients um, you know, a problem, but referrals are a big problem that patients will be sent up to hospitals, but also referrals are part of the challenge. We need that. And so in this setting, because of the sort of iterative process, we suggested that really, well, for starters, let's look at ways in which the current public service, referral hospitals, other services could be a network. And slowly as one gathers information from that network, one could then purchase services in the innovative sort of uh, adaptive approach to widening the, service, the circle to include private specialists, private hospitals, once you've got better data that's coming through. So these were some ideas um, on, on building up a process to expand the NHI to cover other levels of service. The district obviously is an important uh, uh, coordinator and this was important that a practice provide some sort of linkages. It, we must not have uncoordinated services. And in fact, it is an important problem that a district clinical manage a, a current district clinical specialist team supports clinics and could very well support all providers. But what we need to look at is a district management specialist team that supports the uh, sort of new uh, clinics that pass master in accreditation, but need to be built into linking up into such a contract uh, where the payment occurs through capitation, you know, mixed capitation processes. The supply side innovation is basically allowing, as I said, additional services to be built up on a very strong community orientation. So for example, we might get very, very different uh, price points emerging based on this process if we test our pilots on, let's say, dental health, um, oral health. We might be able to look at it with a very strong community orientation, very preventive basis. There isn't that kind of work happening in the public service currently. The same might happen with um, rehabilitation workers, but the key is to get the population um, you know, very captured and clear, and then to work with teams to see what exactly are the services that are, are used and exactly what is the mobility and to think beyond felt needs to actually, you know, uh, you know, to, to real needs. Um, so I think this is really a very big opportunity for innovation, but it starts on the basis of this kind of um, brick in the building. The other elements are, are very similar. The you know, contractor, the provider, which is public or private, would be accredited. There'd be an enrollment process. The data would be submitted electronically. There'd be a peer review system and training would be an expectation. Um, so accreditation, we already have this in the public service and there's a plan for it to happen by the private sector. Um, but there are 6,000, there are 3,000 clinics, but in fact, there are 9,000 or 12,000 
private sector facilities. And so the capacity for the Office of Health Standard Compliance to actually allow this to happen, uh, we suggested some very simple approaches to buy, bypass that capacity where they said they need to visit every clinic. We said, well, that can actually work if you are in contract and you do it on a sort of prospective basis rather than a retrospective basis that you credit. Enrollment, again, once people have got their card in a national system, which makes sure that every single person, which is a real challenge, has got a card, all they need to do is go down to a, any provider and show their card, and they could, in fact, be uh, able to be uh, you know, enrolled with a simple form that goes to the NHI, and they'd be starting to be paid. So it can be very easy to enroll, and we actually suggested as a way to prevent quick changes um, to allow a secondary, you know, primary choice and a secondary choice as well for more migrancy, and also to allow people to change. Uh, and this can actually change depending on the data about how much of that change occurs and how well motivated it is. Uh, once you collect data, you might actually change that up or down. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that any enrollment, there's no, there's no ways that the, the practices are closed, panel sizes are changed. This kind of thing has needs formal approval to prevent people from actually creating, um, you might say, artificial barriers to access or sort of become start discriminating against patients, uh, either racially, but more importantly, based on morbidity, age, etc. cetera. Um, data submission, the expectation is that we in South Africa we have an easily available across Africa is easy payment management systems with EDI. And we said that really needs to be an immediate expectation, uh, no paper, uh, and that we need to evolve to an electronic health record system that be part of the payment for performance system, uh, that by year three, they need to have that, uh, including e-health, uh, mobile health, uh, you know, in the, in, for community health workers. Um, peer review was an important issue. Uh, it needed the, that any referrals be reviewed and that there is a way in which uh, it happens. Um, and that is not a punishing, you know, punishing approach or punitive approach, but that it's supportive uh, and it's strongly linked to upskilling the doctor. And in fact, the key is to add to training that any doctor who's in the system needs to be, especially if he's over uh, less than 15 years of experience, need to get the 18 month diploma in family medicine, which is very much online work based and can be done at a scale across South Africa. Um, already the universities have that in place and that this could be really a very important um, sort of um, career development process for doctors, family doctors in, in Africa. All of these were written up into a full uh, document, uh, a full contract with an explanatory document and provided to the National Health uh, National Treasury I was submitted to the National Health, uh, National Department of Health, and then the presidency. A large measure of the problem that came up in the fact that it's not being implemented in South Africa um, yet is that there is a great deal of resistance by the public service who feel a very strong vested interest in the current approach, current uh, model, um, who feel that this will actually allow many GPs to come in and attract GPs and feel that that will crash the system of private public service clinics, which is complete nonsense because there's not that likelihood that GPs and mass will come along. Um, and in fact, if anything, what this may allow is for us to drop the burden of care on the, on the service and make better quality care emerge even in the public service. Um, and I think that there does need to be a process of empowerment of the public service uh, clinic to actually be competing. Um, and I think that's really the outcome that the, um, uh, the, the average voter in South Africa is expecting. Um, all of this is eminently doable, especially with a contract that's already available for a private sector um, you know, administrator to come on board. And in South Africa, even though in the private sector, the administrator costs are around 15%, uh, the public service GEMS, which is the government employee medical scheme, uh, through tendering out this kind of contract, albeit very small, for 3, 3 million people has been able to drive the cost down to um, 3%. If one has to go about this, even looking at districts and provinces as being small markets tendering, which means that you can have anywhere up to 15 different markets, way in excess of a million people, um, you know, some in excess of 10 million people, 15 million people, um, you will get a huge drop in price of the administrators. But a lot of the quality that of administration brought into the system. And I think this is the other 
the question that you know it, it allows us to move to a very quick implementation. And these were just some ten, some some ways forward that were presented to sort of start with simply testing out at sub-district level uh, or even district level to test out pilots and to look at how this might work. Um, given the sort of legal constraints, uh, procurement constraints in South Africa. Um, and that one of the key things in sharing this with the broader African audience is that really it is just as applicable in any of the settings, but there are variations. I think clearly we do need to start by defining primary health care facilities and the people involved, the, the staff involved in primary care, uh, primary health care. And once we do that, we need to quantify these types, numbers, and their distribution um, in, across the entire country, public and private. Um, we also then need to look at exactly how, given the numbers available within country, can we look at optimal teams per population and find ways in good solid research involving experts in the country, how best can we do that even given, you know, 50% take up by that kind of population of, um, you know, of, uh, of professionals or team members. And then to test out some of these in a progressive way that can one actually look at these teams uh, achieving results. There is an article which I can share on, um, which is not published yet, but I'll share, which uh, I think I've shared in the, in the link uh, to the meeting that, that can produce, uh, show that we can produce very high outcomes um, with low cost. So utilization in Shawello, where I work, has produced a visit rate of less than one um, we produce very high outcomes, very high uh, patient satisfaction rates, um, even with the, um, you know, the service that we provide and the fact that it is constrained uh, largely by, you know, lack, lack of real um, ability to change things within the practice. Um, it's just the family physician working with a small team, um, but it's really strongly empowered. A strong driver to that system is actually the community of workers. Um, and I think this really shows the ability, the possibility in Africa of really strong health professional ability and innovation. Uh, if only the politicians can trust uh, health professionals, the team of Afro PHC um, to be able to guide them forward. So let me stop there. I'm sorry for taking a little longer than I thought, but thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Shabir, for that amazing presentation. I think you've um, really captured a lot of the elements that uh, most uh, African governments actually ignore in PHC. And also thank you for covering the element of um, healthcare financing, which is actually a very important driver of how we build our primary healthcare system. So um, right now we are going to move to a Q&A uh, session with the panelists. And um, if anyone has a question, you can feel free to um, uh, raise your hand and unmute so that you can ask your question. Um, there was a comment from uh, Dr. Eli Bajo from the DRC. Um, I don't know if you're able to un, uh, unmute and um, I have allowed uh, people to unmute so you people can oh, lift right. their hands and contribute. Uh, I think you have, might have some questions you could you could speak to as well. So his comment was directed at uh, Prof uh, Roberts and um, it had to do with how uh, payments, out of pocket payments actually limit access to um, healthcare services. So what happens to patients who can't pay? And um, I think um, then the, the other part of the question I didn't quite understand, but it had to do with uh, building resilient uh, uh, primary healthcare system. Uh, yes. Which, I'm sorry, you can you can go for those questions. I think they pointed at you. Uh, sure, thank you. I'll I'll do my best. Um, there's no question that the more a patient pays out of pocket to access primary care, uh, the more difficulty they will have accessing care. In other words, and their studies are very clear, at least in the United States, that if you make a copayment each time you go in, you've got to pay a certain amount of money. If you make that copayment higher, fewer people will show up for the consultation. Uh, but I think Prof Shabir also offered uh, some other ways of thinking about it, which the pandemic has caused all of us to think about differently. I mean, imagine uh, providing 80% of all your consultations online, which is what most of us did during the worst of the pandemic, because we had to. Now, it, studies, at least in the U.S., show that uh, ultimately most patients prefer an in-person or face-to-face -face consultation, uh, but they, to a great degree, will accept 
these uh, telehealth or e-health consultations uh, when necessary is needed. But all of this, I think, uh, causes us to still overlook what I see as the fundamental failing of all of us in healthcare, which is that we design our systems uh, to be convenient for the professionals. We're happy with how it looks because it makes sense to us and we were the ones that had a big hand in setting it up. Uh, and it focuses on things that we do like services or tasks. And then we talk about who's best suited to provide this service or task. The thing that I think we overlook which is in my view, the essence of all of this is the relationship that you have with the people being served, both at an individual personal level, as well as at a community level. And as um, Mercy said earlier, that all goes to trust. And if you have a system that's not trusted, whether it's a public paid system, a private, it doesn't matter. People won't access the system, they'll go elsewhere. They may go to traditional healers and many times may get a better result. This, you know, we, we think of healthcare as a series of biomolecular reactions. Well, humans are way more complex than that. You know, we, we, we're people that have histories and, and social contexts and, um, and, and beliefs and biases and all sorts of things. And so I think if you build systems to help with healthcare around the principle of establishing trusted therapeutic relationships, it makes much of this easier as time goes by. And I also think it's, uh, it's very ambitious, but it's also very difficult to be able to say that this one approach or model fits every place and everybody because everybody and every place is different. Uh, you, you know, the, uh, the dilemma that Prof Shabir and the other uh, advocates in Africa, just as me in North America have, is that you have to come forward with something when you're making proposals to government or other funders. Otherwise, they're going to throw up their hands and say, well, what are you talking about here? But I think you need to be careful to allow yourself flexibility. The most fun I ever had in practice was when the entire clinic I was working in, as I just started it up, was a nurse, an x-ray technologist, a lab person, and the receptionist, and me. And we all did everybody's job. So when somebody was off at lunch, I was usually answering the telephones and, and doing my charting at the same time. And there was a sense of, uh, of a shared uh, enterprise and experience. The final thing I'll say around primary care teams is that uh, we can easily fall into the trap of more is better. And more is just more. And if I might share um, just a very quick anecdote, uh, we had gone to point of care testing uh, with INR and warfarin management, people on anticoagulation therapy. And we found because as a rural clinic, the time it took to get the specimen up to the hospital for analysis and, and the results back again, and then tracking the patient down, whether to adjust their warfarin uh, was just too much. And so we were able to do at a very minimal cost point of care testing. And we trained our office nurse to do that. And they could walk in, go right to the lab, have their finger poked. Within a minute, they had the INR results. Within two minutes, they had sat down with a nurse and made decisions about whether to change the dose or not, and so on. And patients loved it. Well, because we were part of a much larger university medical group, the, the uh, edict went out from the CEO of the group that, you know, starting January 1st, every clinic's going to have all their anticoagulation managed by the hospital pharmacy service. And I said, not out here, you're not. And the guy said, the CEO said, well, why are you so special again? And I said, because I've got data. So what we did is we allowed, they allowed us to go forward doing what we did while the other 90 some clinics in, their, in the rest of our system had to do it through the hospital pharmacist. And then we looked at the data later and I was able to show them convincingly that it was less expensive the way we were doing it. We actually had a lower complication rate of therapy. One of the things that's used in anticoagulations is the time in the therapeutic window. We did a better job of that. But what really won the day when I presented this to the board of directors was a photograph of a patient. I, I'll call him Charlie. That's not his real name. But he and his wife, Mary, had been patients of mine for many years. And she had passed away from colon cancer. I saw him a month later. He was doing OK. Well, fast forward a year later. And my nurse comes in late one day and says, oh, you know, I saw Charlie today and his INR is fine. I did not adjust his warfarin, but there was something different about him. And I've asked him to see you tomorrow morning. And I said, well, what do you, what's going on? What's, what was different? Well, you know, he usually flirts with me or tells me a dirty joke and he didn't do that this time. 
And, and so I've asked him to come in to see you. So I go in the next morning and I don't recognize the guy in the consultation room. He's sleep deprived. He's all disheveled. He was normally a very kind of what we would call a dapper dad, always very nicely groomed and dressed. And I said, you know, how have you been doing? So oh, I haven't been sleeping well. Well, why is that? Well, Mary keeps coming to me at night in my dreams. That was his dead wife telling me it's time to join her. And I knew that Charlie had been an avid hunter. And I said, Charlie, do you still have any of your guns at home? No, no, I'd given them away. Oh, but I did ask my young grandson back for my favorite target pistol. So just to have something to do. But he was psychotic and suicidal. I admitted him to hospital. He did fine. And in fact, he's a very happy fellow. He's now got a girlfriend, right? So I, but what I said to the board of directors with Charlie's picture on the screen, and I looked each one of them in the eye and said this to them, I said, what we fail to understand, especially in the United States, we do a worse job of this than any place in my experience, but what we fail to understand in healthcare generally is it's not about disease. It's about people who sometimes have disease. And I said, your pharmacist undoubtedly knows the pharmacokinetics of warfarin way better than my nurse does, but they don't know Charlie and she saved his life. And so by having a small enough team, you can't have a team, uh, how many patients, how many people can a patient relate to on a team? One, three, five, 20, 50, 100? I mean, we think of these teams as becoming mega, you know, and now we talk about medical neighborhoods, not just, you know, medical a home, but we talk about medical neighborhoods. So the specialists get, I mean, that gets absurd at some point. You can't have relationships. So think about relationships, think about trust, Think about, remind, remind yourself, I know it sounds silly, but remind yourself, I'm taking care of a person. And everybody in my organization needs to think that way so that we, each of us develops a relationship. The nurse does, you know, the community health worker does. In fact, it, my experience in Africa is many times it's a community health worker that has the best relationship with the individual people out there. So you build on that. Now you're all pulling in the same direction. And what you've unleashed is the most powerful voice of all for change, which is the voice of the people collectively. If I may add to that, thank you, Rich. If I may add to that, uh, Mercy, uh, before our other speakers, um, you know, that's exactly the point in us putting it forward. And I think, yes, the, certainly the detail can appear um, to be a little bit uh, prescriptive um, in terms of what we've put forward. And I think that's useful advice to actually just keep a little bit more flexibility within it. But I think the key point is exactly what you've just said now. Uh, the typical African practicing uh, practice, uh, the way we practice in a clinic or in an OPD is that we are not linked to patients. In other words, we don't have a panel. We don't have any link. And mm -hmm. usually the excuse is, oh, no, no, there's too many people out there. You know, we can't do that kind of thing. Um, and to me, in our setting, even though we have 30,000 people and I'm not seeing every patient, but there is... Um, some semblance of continuity by the by virtue of the wor work that's happening. And there's that kind of continuity which you've talked of. One is the kind of reception and the community health worker and the fact that they can tell me what's going on. And to me, that's yeah. what we need to look at. And I think what we have in Africa is exactly what you have in corporate America, where people have built these huge organizations which become very depersonalized, very fragmented, and people are just you know, a convey in the conveyor belt. And mm -hmm. we have to say, no, we want to move to small teams which people can connect with. And our key challenge is how do we find the size of small team with the right size of population that will satisfy mm -hmm. the difficulty that people are sort of quoting in the, the decision makers quote is, oh, we don't have enough, we've shortages. Um, I, to my mind, I, I, in my practice, you know, it's a very atypical practice with one family physician, maybe of, you know, two doctors to, to 30,000 people. But... And my view, it can work. It's just the fact mm -hmm. that we have a team in place with a mix of the right kind of mix of people. So mm -hmm. I think just to underscore your thing, uh, your, what you've raised, and I'm really pleased that we have people stepping up. So thanks, Mercy, over to you. Um, so I think we are going to have uh, Dr. Ganatra uh, from Kenya. And then uh, after that, uh, we'll take a question from uh, Dr. Ogechi, who's from the UK. So today we have people from even out of Africa. So welcome, uh, Dr. Ganatra. Go ahead. Sorry, Dr. Ganacha, let me just. Uh... Yeah. 
Dr. Ganatra, are you able to unmute? I think I've given you. Perhaps you can take Dr. Ogechi in the meanwhile. Yeah, Dr. Ogechi, are you able to unmute? Hello, good, good afternoon from here. I'm, I'm joining from the UK. I'm a Nigerian doctor who relocated here um, because my husband was here and I trained as a doctor here. I actually, right from medical school, wanted to do family medicine. But then I think because family medicine is still an emerging, not really emerging, um, it's not as popular as the other specialties in Nigeria. So I think I got a lot of pushback, like um, family medicine consultants are not real consultants, <laughs> as they said. And then when I came here, I decided to do, it's called general practice here. And mm. we train for three years. It's more like a vocational scheme. We would do some hospital postings and do uh, postings in clinics, in community. And I still got the same vibe, like GPs and not consultants. Um, we have a different regist register for general practitioners, which is different from the uh, register for specialists. So there's still that friction that we get. So um, I, I, it's been a really insightful talk listening to Professor Chabert. And um, I really resonated with a lot of what he said about how the practice is done back home in Africa. And I think, the same happens in Nigeria because I do travel home like twice a year to do some health outreaches. I've tried to see if I can get the posting in a, in a hospital close to where I live so I can do some free healthcare um, work. But then I've been told, oh, you need to retrain in the Nigerian system that what we do in the UK is more of social medicine. You know, there's a lot of depression, loneliness, anxiety, isolation. And um, we, do, we, we, we do a lot of more like a first responder work and then we refer into hospital. So I really wanted to ask, um, I think I've forgotten the, the professor's name who spoke about um, Prof. Roberts. doing Prof. telemedicine. Prof. Professor Roberts, yeah. Yeah, Professor Roberts, yeah. I mentioned something about doing telemedicine, like more is more. Is it really necessary? Because in Nigeria, we really haven't got that coverage of internet. And patients really suffered during the COVID period. So my question is, are there any practical ways that we can still do remote consultations? Because here right now I'm in clinic and I see most of my patients on Skype or on telephone or using all sorts of internet links. How can we develop a system to take care of our patients? Because the pandemic, I don't know, I think it's come to stay. So I'm thinking we should be able to adapt. That's one question. And my second question was about the diploma in family medicine that you said is being done in South Africa. Can it be done online? And then maybe students, can we visit? You know, because I would love to, you know, improve my career progression. So those are my questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ogechi. Uh, Prof. Shabir, would you like to uh, take those questions? Okay, I think that, uh, yeah, maybe uh, Rich can also respond, but yeah, I think uh, family medicine, uh, we actually are having a weekly CPD meeting, and I will be presenting um, on in the February, first week of February, uh, a CPD meeting on primary health care and family medicine principles. A lot of people don't appreciate family medicine is not just about doctors, it is about the entire team, it provides some really good insights in the way in which uh, I think Rich brought up the question of relationships. How do you actually structure the interaction between a provider and a, uh, a patient um, to produce real strong patient-centeredness? Um, so I think uh, the family medicines are growing in Africa and we'd really love the support. So I think, uh, Dr. Ogechi, if you can find ways to support it, I'd really uh, you can email me and we can link you up to other people in Nigeria. Um, in addition to that, I know that in Nigeria, there is a diploma, I understand that it's stalled somewhat, uh, that has been sort of developed to sort of uh, get the GPs up some. Uh, this is the same diploma, similar diploma in South Africa, and there's an interest growing uh, across Africa for the diploma as well. But the full MMED program, which is, um, you know, includes the hospitalist uh, range of work, uh, is the common modality for training of family physicians across Africa. I'm not, 
I, I'm a fan of the of the GP model, which is the two year diploma training, and that eventually evolving into the sort of more appropriate family physician training. I think uh, you know hospitalists need another career path as a subspecialty, if you might call it, of family medicine. Um, so these are just my thoughts around it. The diploma uh, in South Africa, it's an 18 month online work based type diploma. Um, there is some work done in Afro PhD. So if you go to the website, you'll actually see what we're developing as a mod, uh, as a course within WITS, which shares kind of the, some of the elements. And in fact, we looked looking at how to build around that the clinical groups, uh, sort of clinical training materials. Uh, it's a big process, but I think it's a, a very useful one as a repository of material for different, um, you know, for different universities across the continent and other groups to perhaps use that to deliver training in, in primary care family medicine uh, and potentially bring it together in courses in various ways. So we Thank are going to make that work done and available. So watch out. Thank and you. Um, Dr. Wamala, um, I think from Uganda, wants to know whether there's a cost to that course, the diploma the in family diploma, medicine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I may respond to that, yes, I think these are all currently being done um, as university courses. Um, what we are looking to do is to build up that capacity amongst universities first, but uh, it might also be available through, you know, but I really wouldn't hold my breath immediately. It's going to take a lot of work. I think a year or two to get it in available. And um, what we're doing is trying to find ways it can be free, but for other universities to use. And so there's a cost depending on the universities coming on. I think at some point we might look at it, but I think there's going to be a cost because it's not, um, you know, it's not easy to put something like that out free. But the CPD meetings for any Afro PHC member is free. Please join the Afro PHC and you'll be given, um, you know, you'll be getting. Uh, a link to the WCEA, the World Continuing Education Alliance uh, app. And from there, you can get to all the CPD meetings which we're planning, but free. Thanks. All right. Um, I think the other part of her question was on how, how we can adapt because uh, it's like COVID is here to stay. So how do we serve our patients? Especially she mentioned that Nigeria, not all patients can be able to access telemedicine services. Oh, telemedicine, so how yes. do we adapt to continue with the PHC services that we've been given? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure Rich can speak to that. I, I mean, even in the rural areas of the US, they have internet challenges. So you do what you can with what you got. And I think that, you know, don't underestimate, we think that the value of a community health worker is a useful one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get a community health worker visiting that home to check on that patient and to support. And, you know, that's part of the equation in, in our, the African setting, uh, not just as, a, in my view, just as, a, a, you know, for now, but permanently, <laughs> that's an important feature. Uh, I think internet, the, the sort of IT capacity with people, people, people via internet or, will depend on these capacities. Um, sorry, can I just mute someone? Um, these will depend very much on the infrastructure going forward. I think we must not underestimate that, you know, the IT infrastructure is growing quite quickly in Africa. Um, I think that there's a big push and I think we need to advocate for a bigger push for that infrastructure, which is national systems of internet bandwidth improvements. Um, I, I think if you're looking at uh, mo mobiles, the penetration in Africa is hugely better than some other very developed parts of the world. I think the way we use it is also no, no, no. Hugely different to other parts of the world. So I think that don't underestimate our ability. But I think just plain money spent on infrastructure like big level bandwidth will be a really important government investment. It's just, it's like highways. You know, we haven't got enough highways in Africa. Uh, we need highways, physical and virtual. If, if, if I might, Mercy, just add to that a little bit. Yes. yes. Um, so so uh, uh, Dr. Argechi brings up a very important point, uh, but it causes me to think back to almost 30 years ago when I had an exchange program with the University of Illora in, in Nigeria. And we would have students with us for three months at my clinic and then uh, from Nigeria. And then I would send my students there and then the professors would go back and forth. And in those days, uh, the best you could do was to send a, a letter by post. 
and it might be a month or two before you got back. Now, when I go back and visit, everybody's got two and three and four mobile phones. So I think if anything, relationships have become easier rather than more difficult. Uh, I mean, social media certainly uh, adds to that. And you got to be very careful, obviously, with health and privacy and all of that. But uh, the, the analogy that I sometimes use, and it's, it, it's not a perfect one, but it's the best I can think of, is sort of think of relationships in the way that we think of our families. And in many ways, your GP becomes mom, <laughs> your mother, and you find ways to stay connected to mom. It might be because you've called your auntie who lives, you know, five kilometers away from mom and she walks to mom's place and tells, gives her an update on her daughter, but you manage to stay connected because you know the relationship is valuable. And whether it's actually mom or your uncle or your grandfather or whoever it is, that's what families do. That's how humans are wired. And healthcare needs to reflect how humans deal with the world not deposing on the people this sort of abstract idea about what healthcare should look like. The people will guide us if we give them the opportunities to do that. Um, thank you so much for that, uh, uh, Prof. Roberts. Um, we're going to take a question from Peter, then Jonathan, and please keep it short because um, we still have a discussion uh, question that uh, uh, we, are, we, we were supposed to have in the groups, but we are going to have it in the general discussion. So please keep your questions short. Uh, Peter? Very much, yeah. Well, uh, I'm from Holland and uh, I was for a long time connected through uh, European Primary Care and uh, to, to Afro PhD. And uh, I've been active in Africa as a tropical doctor and have been teaching management. And uh, that I was very pleased with these two presentations. Fantastic. It's the gospel of family medicine. And especially uh, Shabir uh, pointed out how we could realize that financially. Uh, my teachings was always about. Uh, it's all about money. That was the, the, the teaching because that's essentially you have to think it through in money. And he came up with a model that, in my opinion, is the brick of a good healthcare system. We should make Shabir Minister of Health in, 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 in South Africa or maybe Africa to bring this system of team that, uh, uh, that are contracted by insurances uh, to. Uh, to really go for a certain population, to have a certain pride in it, to have a personal relationship with it. And it doesn't matter so much, I think, what the team, how it is built up. It can be two nurses in one district or four doctors in the other. doesn't matter so much as long as you give performance data on everything from the care, the immunizations to whatever. And so I'm, I was really very happy. And uh, I have only one question to Shabir. Uh, very shortly, uh, that I, 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 I don't know if there's much evidence to do a five year uh, uh, checkup of people. You see, I'm very, the Dutch are very anti checkups, and there's no evidence for that. So that's maybe why I have this question, but it may be a different thing. So I, that was a question to him. Yeah, if I can quickly respond to that, uh, it's, it's actually about making sure that every person enrolled gets at least one visit to check the person in terms of a preventive uh, approach. Well, that makes and sense. Yeah, perfect. Not, yeah, yeah. Okay. Not, yeah, yeah, not yeah, yeah, the yeah. regular <laughs> patient, because generally the regular patient will get that somewhere along the line. But the key is to, is to, uh, to get that mentality in the clinician to say, have I seen everyone and is everyone able to? And I think that it could be you know, modified to be simply a screening process more than a visit. But I think I mean, that you could, you could add that to the performance uh, indicator. That's exactly right. So that a GP or a, a, the team actually sees as part of their performance those people who haven't visited, have I checked on them? And I think one important thing is you didn't mention that really because it's a sensitive thing. It's the amount of ownership. You see, you said there should be one doctor. Uh, it's not so clear who should have the ownership. In fact, the team should have the ownership. No, that's that, it's more difficult. But in fact, I, I hope the doctors take pride, in entrepreneurial pride for their population. Uh, and that can also be nurses or managers. Yeah. As, as the team does what it does. 
Um, so Thank I was so much sorry about this presentation. Fine. Thank you yes. so much for your comments. So, Those are very pertinent. My name is Mims Very quickly, to just sorry. respond to that, uh, Mercy, I just want to say that uh, there is an article around the question of leadership where we say that that, that, that is not about a doctor. Uh, it can leadership is amongst anybody in the team. Uh, what we have to think through, though, is clinical governance and the role of the doctor in ensuring, especially uh, the question of gateway, like uh, like uh, for, for Rich raised, or to other levels of care and ensuring the support to the team. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And then uh, we'll move on to the discussion and hopefully some of the comments and other uh, questions will come up as we go along. Jonathan. Thank you so much, Dr. Mercy, for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Professor Shabi and uh, Professor Roberts. And coming back to maybe I want to highlight just to what uh, Dr. Ogechi uh, asked, maybe also to think about the public awareness with regard to mental health would be much better because most of our community, they don't know exactly the first symptoms, how we can guide those who are developing symptoms with regard to mental health. And even some healthcare workers, they don't know it as they used to associate it most of the time with witchcraft and so on. And thank you very much again for having, uh, as Dr. Roberts explained, having a small team within the facility and that could be better to look after patients. And maybe this can also be um, a, a good way how we are as a, doctors in Africa can be working. Um, yes, I can compare my country, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, with South Africa and in Namibia. I can see there are so many um, differences that is happening in terms of the policy, the way it has been designed, and then how it can be applicable in the different areas. Now, my question is, how can we adjust Western medicine in African context based on our cultures and belief? As we know that, some culture, they always think of their doctors and the, according to their belief, should we train doctors based on the tribes or based on the area they are located or how can we tackle this situation? Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for that question, um, Jonathan, and bringing up the issue of um, mental health in primary health care. And I believe we'll have a workshop on that so that uh, that, that uh, would be a very great workshop also to attend. So um, Prof Shabir, Prof Roberts, would you like to take on that? Perhaps quickly, I think um, mental health is really a key part of um, you know, the guidelines that need to guide it. And I think it's, it's important practice uh, amongst any family doctors. It's one of those things that a lot of doctors um, seem to shrink from in after training, which is it, when it's really part of their training, and that's one of the key key parts of the um, of the training of a diploma is to make sure that everybody's brought skilled up, and that that cascade cascades into the team so that they feel competent to manage a whole range of elements, priority health conditions. Um, you know, some parts of the uh, of the continent, uh, people don't treat HIV routinely. They send it off to the public service. We need them to all do that. So I think it's really about bringing everybody up to skill. Um, I think the question you raised or the issue you raised, um, so what, Mercy, what was the other element in terms of- um, He wanted to know how we can um, adapt Western medicine and oh, contextualize yes. it to the uh, African uh, yeah. context. Yes, yeah. I, I think that's an important one. I think that traditional culture uh, is actually important that we train and medical schools include that culture um, and including the primary care, a uh, culture of primary care and the way in which we deliver care in, in schools. Um, and I think training from rural communities so that really one gets rural retention. But I think there's another culture and it, it prompts me to think that what the one, the biggest problem, and you point, kind of pointed it, um, we have these large institutions, you know, primary health care in, uh, in Africa, big, big semi hospitals almost, and, um, you know, very much hospitalized hospital, this thinking, uh, large conveyor belts. In the community health center where I functioned, we had set up one small section to deal with this very personalized care. When we tried to convince the rest of the community health center to adopt this by saying, well, let's make different wards in different parts of the facility and rearrange ourselves to care for different communities. There was a rebellion. And the rebellion came from healthcare workers, mostly nurses, some doctors, who did not like that idea because it brought much more accountability. 
it made their fact that they were disappearing in the afternoons, they come late, that they're sometimes not on duty, harder to hide. And they didn't want that. So I think the culture of the public service in Africa is a huge challenge if we are going to move towards a very much more team-based approach linked to a population. It's going to be exposed very quickly. And I think we need to appreciate some of these cultural change management problems. Thank you so yeah, much. Okay. Go ahead, Mercy, Professor Butts. Thank you. Well, I, I, the second question that Dr. Jonathan raised is one I'd like to touch on. And again, the experiences I've had in different parts of the world have really been helpful to me. So for example, when, when I would be at Elora and at the University of Elora in, in Nigeria, it's kind of where the three major tribes of Nigeria intersect or meet each other, Yoruba, Hausa, and Igbo. And, and what I would ask people was, is it important if you're Hausa that you be taken care of by a Hausa doctor? And the answer that I got consistently from everyday people was, I just want somebody that gets to know me and that's good at what they do. And this came home to me when I practiced for a time on a Native American reservation in New Mexico. And at one end of the building was the traditional shaman or healer from that tribe. It was the Hopi tribe. And at the other end of the building was me and the other Western trained people. And there would be times when I'd send a patient down the hall to the shaman. Uh, be, well, there was one example of a young man who was terribly depressed, but the reason he was depressed was that he had stolen a pickup truck and the entire village had had ostracized him and sort of pushed them out because he didn't take accountability for it. So the shaman took care of that. I referred him to the shaman and he took care of that by doing a ceremony that basically forgave him his sins and he was able to reintegrate with the tribe. Whereas the shaman saw a fellow that had been coughing for six months and now coughing up blood, he sent him down the hall to me because he had tuberculosis, which was a white man's disease. So I think when you, to, to my way of looking at it, you need to be sure that the people providing care reflect the community uh, color language you know religion all of those things need to be reflected there but at the end of the day it really comes down to how adaptable the professional providing the care is and how uh, willing and eager they are to learn and understand and absorb the culture and the language and all the other parts of it so it's a really important question but i think you're going to get about 7.9 billion different answers because that's how many people there are on the planet. And at the end of the day, it's about having the person know, feel known and trusted and they trust and know you. That to me is what it comes down to. And mostly, um, sorry, if, if we also did a okay. very similar exercise in Shawelo, um, which was very novel. Um, but most of the conversation when we set, started it up was the, the sense of antagonism that traditional healers feel from the sort of allopathic system. The health system treats them as outcasts. And we had to really deal lots with that. Now, one of the key things we tried to explore in Shawello in that small setting was how do we find ways to understand the kind of possibilities in the traditional space? And usually they know better what we offer and we kind of can improve that. But it was exactly what we wanted was what Rich was doing is to find ways to refer to each other and work collaboratively. And I think that is the attitude we should approach. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for those um, comments and uh, sharing your experience. I'm sure Jonathan appreciates that and can really ap apply that in his setting. And um, with that, I'd like to close the Q&A session for now. Do you want um, to just give the two people, I think just two or three people Grace, the chance, I think, and then think, we'll, we'll just see if we can go into your, the discussion briefly. Because I All think right. we're getting a sense of the people and I think rather let's use the opportunity for them to speak. Okay, great. Um, so we had Grace um, and then um, Okoyen. Yeah, I think Dr. Grace, Lee, go ahead and sure unmute. He wants to speak. Um, he doesn't mind putting up his hand as well so that we know he's definitely wanting to speak, Dr. Lekiwi. Grace? Uh, we Grace. can't we can't hear you, Grace. Um, Grace, maybe you could just type in the chat because we are not we, we can't hear you. There's a problem with your audio. I think if she could also go on and come back again, um, maybe you can go yeah. on. You can try that, uh, Grace. 
just try um, leaving the meeting and then signing on, signing back on. Yeah. Uh, Okoyen, go ahead as we wait for Grace. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, it's been a great pleasure being part of this webinar and the uh, Afro PAC. Um, I'm actually on the road, so I may not be able to say much, but the discussions are so interesting and it brings to bear a whole lot that uh, we need to address in our continent. I'm in Nigeria and I work in the Ministry of Health in Nigeria. And uh, we have a terrain that uh, is such a difficult terrain where a lot of remote areas with a uh, lack of infrastructure and lack of access to even internet services. So when someone talk about remote uh, consulting, it's, it's a lot more difficult because we have the infrastructural challenge here. And then we will also talk about uh, adopting the type of care, bringing in the African context. It's, it's most appropriate because you see, what we are battling with here is such that now, for instance, you talk about antenatal care um, um, and then childbirth, our people believe so much in traditional medicine and the traditional uh, better attendance. They will register in the hospital, orthodox hospitals for ANC, but they will end up going to the traditional birth attendants and then to deliver uh, with the traditional birth attendants. What's, what is it about? It's about the culture. The, what, how people are in tune with their culture is what is playing out. So the practice of medicine should be such that we adopt what is the, the way, the lifestyle of the people, how best we get across to them. So I'm quite uh, excited about these discussions, how we can model healthcare delivery to really um, address the needs and the culture of our people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think you're echoing something that um, is underlying the whole discussion here, the issue of culture, because as we are trying to experiment with different practice models and redesign and design them, then that is something that needs to be addressed. So thank you so much for that comment. Um, I was just going through the, um, the chat and um, uh, I think it's um, just, I'm just going to read out some, some um, key comments and um, issues that people has, have raised. Um, we have uh, Dr. Jemima Great. who has, has raised the issue of um, hierarchies in professional delivery of services, task shifting, remunerations and their effects on uh, efficient PHC and UHC. And I think this, uh, this will actually move us into the question we are discussing today. And um, someone was asking actually for a software engineer to help design something in PHC and someone else uh, from the group has actually sorted him out, which is great. That just so shows how Afro PHC fosters collaboration. And um, uh, so um, we have um, uh, Scott uh, from West Coast United States who's joined us and um, he's saying he's amazed by the commitment and collaboration of uh, the Afro community. Um, so uh, thank you, Prof. Shabir, for bringing this community together. And um, so um, with that, uh, Prof. Shabir has posted uh, the question for <coughs> today and on the on the chat we'll go through it but i just want to say thank you to prof uh, richard uh, for being with us today for taking your time to answer the questions and sharing your experience and at this point if, in case you have any other meeting we can release you thank you so much thank you if not you can continue on with us into the discussion um, so we normally have a discussion question because um, part of the this is a this is a policy workshop and a lot of what you contribute really goes a long way into contributing to the policies that we have for PHC in Africa. So today, um, the question we are going to address is what are the PHC practice model issues for universal healthcare coverage in Africa? 
And once we uh, look at these issues, then how can we use emerging PHC practice models like what we've seen in the presentations today to support the development of PHC and UHC in Africa? So again, feel free to raise your hand and um, we'll kick off the discussion from there. Thank you, Prof. Richards. Thank you, Rich. You, you, you're free to, to keep with us if, you, if you're available. Yes. Well, what I, I, I will have a, another meeting shortly, but if I could just offer uh, just a <laughs> final kind of thought. Um, uh, first, Thank I'd you. like to... I'd like to congratulate my colleague from the West Coast of the United States. You know, I, I, I got up at 4 a.m. He must have been up at 2 a.m. So there's commitment around the world for PHC in Africa. Um, the, but the thing I wanted to say that may sound a little crazy, but I'm going to say it, is uh, I think one of the mistakes we've made in primary care is focusing exclusively on the poor, the disadvantaged, and the dispossessed. And the reason that I say that, I've spent my entire career taking care of poor people in rural settings. But the reason I say that is there's a, a United States Senator, Jacob Javits, who once said, show me a program for the poor and I'll show you a poor program. And if you really want to begin to change your societies, whatever model we have that pushes this idea of relationships and primary health care, you've got to have also the influential, the elite, the powerful embracing it as something that they really want. In other words, you win the day by showing them better. That yes, you can go to your hospital-based, specialist-centric, you know, conveyor belt healthcare system, but it doesn't work very well. The death rates are higher. Barbara Starfield has shown us that. The satisfaction is lower and the costs are extremely higher. So we show them better. And you actually, we, we need to be careful to, to not use the language of victimization or oppression, which is definitely going on out there. But the reason you want to be careful with that is you want to show them that, that actually what you have is not only going to be better for the poor folks out there, it's going to be better for everybody. And then they're more likely to commit to it at a national level. So that would be the one piece of advice I've learned in the United States. It really took the results of the HMO experience in the 90s and the 2000s to show American healthcare consumers that they were not getting a very good value from what they were buying and it was time to change. And that has been as important creating change as anything else. So I will step away and, and keep up the good work, keep the faith. Uh, we're gonna get there someday as Martin Luther King uh, reminded us, it's a tall mountain, but we're all gonna get there someday. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Just take care now. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Prof. Roberts. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Perhaps um, I could just quickly um, preface it. I just want to tell people also, um, uh, please unmute, uh, please uh, pick up your hand. I know we've, uh, we've un people have unmuted. If you can, I've, I've muted you because we're not just having sound control problems. So if you can pick up your hand and then we'll unmute you, it'll be better to manage. I just want to sort of preface that. Um, I think uh, there's uh, some one or two questions I could answer as well, Mercy. I think that we are, we are, we are sharing these, uh, the presentations uh, largely to stimulate thinking and I did to see what's, you know, to, to see what is, um, what are thoughts out there in this community um, and how do they relate to these ideas. Um, I think we are going to build some of these ideas into the document. And I think we are almost ready to do that document uh, in the next one or two weeks. It'll go to the executive board and, um, and I think they're just flying these, uh, floating these ideas and getting some sort of reflections as has been today uh, is really very helpful. Um, and it is gonna improve the overall document. And at some point, we're gonna make it available to all of you. So please um, look at this, uh, uh, you know, the question as stimulating your thought um, process so that you can say, um, you know, whether you thought the ideas were good and what you thought good or what was not so good, um, these can also be contributions, you know, um, to the discussion. I just want to say that uh, in answer to the question, while people are picking up their hands, because I don't know, I've put people on mute and they haven't picked up their hands since. Uh, but the question uh, I think is uh, that, that Grace asks about, um, you know, nurses uh, being covered. I think the question is, how do we work as a team? I think saying we don't have a doctor, so we'd get nurse. To me, that's the wrong thinking. 
Uh, if we have a certain number of doctors and certain number of nurses and a certain number of any cadre, we've got to say, how do we work in the whole country, uh, public and private, to put them together in a model that can work, you know, however we do it. I think that's going to be different countries, different answers. The key point is, is there a team linked to a population? And I think that we, we started off our discussions last year about Afro-PHC. And the big question was, who should be part of primary health care? And it was everybody. So we even have to ask the question, what number of uh, dentists or oral hygienists do we actually think through in terms of oral health? What is the number that we have in the country? What can we actually put together as a team, uh, including the community health workers and the other clinic providers and the, the dentist and the you know, oral hygienist, whatever, to now look per population. So this is a lot of work that needs to happen across the country, across the, the continent. And, but it is a way to, to, to take the principle. And I think that's what we need to get across in our, our document, the principle which we talked about today. Big organizations are not personalized care. We need to bring the number down where we say, let's have a small team dealing with a small population. How that works is the, you know, for the country is a question we need to flesh out. So I hope that gets, and I think the question of how can we look for recognition empowerment the entire team needs empowerment, and it is in our objectives that Afro PHC is about how do all of us help each other. We need, like we are asking the question, the clinical associates are not as strong as the doctors and the clinical and the nurses. How can we help them to become stronger? We don't have a presence of community of workers. How can we get them to be stronger? Um, we don't have enough of the rehab, rehab of uh, you know, professionals across the continent. How can we help them to strengthen that presence across the continent? Everybody's needed. Just the way in which we plan it is going to be the question we need to put forward. Um, I think there's another question maybe for Michael. I have not allowed people to unmute themselves, but please pick up your hand. We would like you to speak uh, rather than use the chat. So if you just pick up your hand, use the reactions and pick up your hand, then I'll, we'll unmute you. Um, I think the question is audit. Uh, I think that's one of the key things that uh, is the role of a well-trained doctor. Many doctors are not having the skill, but we need to build that skill up and we need them to skill other people. You know, it's what Rich talked about. Um, you know, his receptionist observes she has her own skills, but at the end of the day, she would now learn a whole lot because in that conversation Rich had with her, when he was talking about this patient who came in disheveled, he'd be able to tell her, you know, that's actually something that I would pick up as a problem and keep that in mind. Now she's educated, she can do things. And I think we need to look at how do we build in competencies into the team so that our quality raises for everybody. And what are the simple ways to do that? I think it's extremely wasteful to look at courses upon courses where there's very little accountability most of the time in South Africa, my experience of courses, it's an opportunity to go off and have a free day and also to get some money. And when you come back, nobody even bothers to ask you what you're going to do with it. And to me, that's wasteful training. And we do that a lot. And people come back, they don't really implement it because they somehow move because that's the nature of the sort of uh, place in, in, you know, where everybody moves to different places every six months. But they lose their skills in, you know, they, they, they say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't deal with family planning. 12 months later, they say, I know nothing about family medicine, uh, family planning. How can you know? How can you do that? And I think this is the thing. We need to keep the skills of the whole team always robust um, and deal with it. And I think that includes uh, the skill at audits, which is a very simple thing, part of quality improvement and, uh, you know, clinical governance. Um, I think where there's, let me just- yeah, We have um, Ellie Bajo and Michael who raised their hands. Okay, let's go with Ellie first. Okay. Ellie, I hope you're able to, yeah, they're great. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Maxi. Uh, I'd like to give some issues as uh, we are at discussion, discussions time. Now, um, the first one is uh, the African paradox. In Africa, we, we know we see uh, health providers who are unemployed in urban areas. And as is, 
as a population who are not covered. It is a, a, a paradox. Uh, another, another issue, it is about uh, that what we found in uh, COVID pandemic, COVID-19 COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, in DRC, we have built a team with a, have a, a community, com community health worker and a nurse to take care of patients at, uh, who are uh, isolated at home. But it doesn't work well. Uh, for, for that, I don't know if you would like also to capacitate uh, those uh, community health workers to join the, the, the team and to be, uh, to be helpful in the, in the team. Uh, another another one it is about uh, in Africa we we, we are depending on uh, uh, partners aids it is a great issue a great challenge and now I don't know if it is uh, it is to us to recommend to government is to to put more more budget in uh, health system but it is a most issue about uh, depending on a uh, partner's aid, which is, is not sustainable. It's not an issue. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, that's what I would like to add in this time. Thank you. Over to you, Mary. Um, thank you so much, Ellie. If I've got you uh, right, one of the things you raised is the issue of capacity building, that we have workers, but they're not, um, they do not have the capacity to do what we need them to do. And you've mentioned the issue of capacity building for uh, community healthcare workers. Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I yes, I think, yeah. That. So, I think it's also yeah. raised the question of unemployed professionals and sort of urban rural distributions as well. Um, so perhaps I can just respond to that if you don't mind, Mercy. Uh, sure, go I ahead. I think this question, you know, what you've set up is exactly the approach we want to have where teams actually support each other. I, I mean, I teach community of workers. Um, we taught them, we built up skills. We also have a regular approach in the practice, which is part of the public service. I think very similar to what you have in the hub where we teach community of workers every Friday, we spend the morning. But also in that process, we actually tell the community of workers, you need to teach our young students, doctors, how to think about communities. Expertise is not just, you know, cascading down. We all have expertise and we need to find ways to exchange it. And that approach to people and the full team that everyone has value is the way you empower people. And I think that's the kind of attitudes we need to move away from very hierarchical thinking um, towards think, thinking about uh, you know, how we expect us to treat our patients as human beings equals to ourselves. Um, and, and I think that is the ethos, which um, you know, is part of family medicine that I uh, personally advocate for. So I think uh, you know, what you do is great and community health workers are an essential part of the team. I, my view, they should be paid, they should be um, you know, integral and they, they, especially in Africa where we have lots of literacy problems and culture challenges, we need them to be negotiating those issues and they build up a huge amount of expertise in that work. I think the unemployed professional in the urban settings to me, I think that, you know, yes, certain settings, they are, uh, they are unemployed, but, um, you know, I've seen also people who find employment in the private sector uh, and are sitting in the urban settings. We need to find ways to redistribute across to rural areas. And I think this is part of that funding uh, as well as contracting process is that we want to create a way, you know, in which um, resources are allocated more to rural communities. So, for example, in the proposal I made, we, we actually said that rural areas need adjustments. Uh, even some under, uh, you know, uh, you might say semi-peri-urban -peri sites, townships and difficult to access areas in, certain, in the urban settings also represent challenges. So it shows socioeconomic indexes should be useful to adjust. So your actual payment is going to be better if you go to such areas. You should be paid because the costs can be higher. Um, so I think the and these are costs not just of 
you know, uh, personnel um, uh, and, and maybe some of the consumables. Uh, but the, you know, the hidden costs of schooling, et cetera, that should be part of a personnel cost. So one needs to find ways to reflect that in remuneration systems so that it is attractive to go into a rural area and especially attractive for those who come from a rural area to go back. Um, so these are, are just questions. I think you raised about partners. Um, you know, I didn't mention it, but we want to make that a key feature of the document is that the current approach of partners and we have ways to engage with some of these at a, at a global level um, where we are going to put the screws on them. There are already screws on them that at country level, they need to work very closely with government and they need to pool their funding and work collaboratively with governments in terms of unfolding a proper primary health care system. And the models we want to put forward, like the one we are saying, um, we'd like that to be where they put their money, where their mouth is and, and to move away from the sort of disease focused approach that they have currently. They are already in that space thinking about it. And I think that Joseph Anna raises in the, uh, you know, in the uh, chat, um, it would be nice if you could speak a fair bit as well, if you can just raise his hand. Yeah. Um, that PAC is a practical approach to care. Yes, it's, it's, it's actually an extension of an old approach in South Africa, uh, which has really, it's part of the task shifting, task sharing approach where nurses, in South Africa, nurse clinicians uh, were supported through a PHC, you know, essential treatment, uh, 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 this was the standard treatment guideline, essential drug list, which basically had algorithms uh, around common diseases with treatments, exactly what the doses, et cetera, should be. And this forms a key part of their learning. They learn around it and that's their practice manual, so to say. And this has been, extrapolated into PAC to develop it around the chronic care, non-communicable disease uh, with a much more robust approach. And I think that itself is, uh, you know, an approach that's growing across the continent. So uh, I think that's the, um, you know, a very useful approach. But again, you know, uh, the problem is that the idea that one can simply take a book and toss it at a nurse give them some training and then they face a patient and they haven't the ability to, um, you know, to face complexities any more than that or have the support systems to deal with complexity. These are some of the challenges. And we think that if there's a team-based approach, you can actually get their skills enhanced far more than those algorithms that are in PAC and the EDL, et cetera, and build up skills far better uh, in a, you know, a sustainable fashion. So I think it's part of the solution but it's not the entire solution. And I think that you know, community health workers need to be paid. It's a position that we would like to support. Um, so let me stop there. I think I've answered the questions. I see- um, Michael. Michael has okay. got his hand up. Yeah. Let me just help unmute him, sorry. Sorry, I have the controls on my side. So thanks, it was mercy. I think Michael, your voice- Go is ahead, Michael. Through. Um, we can't, we're, we're not able to hear you. Michael, maybe you just switch off and come back on. It, it probably is a connection issue. We've been sort of fiddling controls. Maybe if you can just stop and come back. Um, so I'm just going to read some questions some of what yeah. is on the chat. I think uh, Wamala is asking the problem is who will pay the CHWs? And is the measure sustainable? Yeah, I think that's an important problem. I think that in South Africa, there is a, um, uh, a, a growing uh, approach to paying community health workers. Initially, it was trying to control the wage bill for government. So they ran it through, uh, through NGOs um, and kept the, the sort of salary down to the minimum wage in the country. But it, it has created problems because in the public service, because of this um, culture problem, uh, nurses, I mean, the staff within the public service have started pushing onto the, the community health workers um, more tasks. And in some ways, their burden has grown and they are pushing for larger salaries. And that's creating a bit of a problem in the country. And I'm not sure how sustainable it is where salaries were doubled in fact more than doubled 
But at the same time, we've compared the kind of capacity uh, or the work that is being done by community health workers in South Africa with equivalent community health workers in Brazil, because we've had Brazilian students and where our community health workers are seeing six persons, people, persons a day, uh, in Brazil, they're seeing 30 patients a day. And, and they're working double the time, even though they're getting an equivalent salary. So I think we do need to actually manage the community health worker uh, much better than in South Africa. I do think they need a remuneration. Otherwise, volunteerism is really a challenging thing to do. And I think these are the poorest in, of society. And I'm of the view that, that the community health worker employment itself will contribute to uh, an important social objective of jobs and economic growth, because that's disposable income going to a local community, often to the lowest, uh, you know, lowest income. So to me, there's a logic in that process. So I would strongly advise that we, uh, that we uh, you know, push that idea in Afro-PHC. I hope we can yes. unmute. Uh, so Michael is Michael. back. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Michael. Michael, are you able to get it right now? Maybe just without video. Okay. No. Michael, see if you can do it without video. I'm not sure that'll help. Ah, we... oh, okay. we're getting you now. We're getting you. Yes. yes. You, 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 you can hear me now. We can hear you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, invitation to this very interesting uh, meeting. Uh, I raised the issue of audit. Uh, I, I, uh, I learned about audit 30 years ago. I have a grant from uh, Athens Medical Association for postgraduate education in uh, abroad. So I was attached for several months in UK, and uh, uh, then uh, I learned about it, uh, and I found it very, uh, very useful in my everyday practice. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's it's a useful. Sorry, uh, Michael, did you you you're muted? Uh, it is not uh, very difficult to to perform this uh, way of uh, practicing. Everything we do in practice, we compare with some uh, standards. And because, as as I have said to Professor Mosa, I am from Greece, but I uh, I am involved in the uh, in the effort of the Orthodox Mission in uh, Kinshasa to. Um, to run uh, to run a health center and the second time uh, to, to involve to be involved with the training as we said uh, for uh, not not for doc to train doctors is the difficult uh, stuff but to train uh, nurses uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's it looks easier and as uh, as I I'm informed for, for, from your interesting uh, meetings, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, the need we, we want in order to improve uh, uh, healthcare in in Africa. Thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Michael, um, for that because I think also that speaks to the issue of uh, quality, um, because as Prof. Uh, Roberts mentioned. Um, it's not just about adding more and more professionals. It's also about um, checking what it is that they're doing. And I think audits help with that. And they help also to check on performance and are you doing what you ought to do or what the community needs. Um, so thank you so much uh, for that contribution, Michael. Um, anyone else? I'm not seeing any other raised hands. Um, but there are two issues I've just seen in the chat that also I think you'd spoken to about them, Prof. Shabir, the issue of shortages, because there are two people who've mentioned shortages. And um, I think Joseph has mentioned it as being a huge challenge in African PHC. How do we do it with the shortages? But then again, is it a question of shortage or distribution, as you mentioned? 
where you have uh, all professionals in urban and peri-urban areas and none in the rural, and it looks like a shortage, yet it's a distribution problem. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah, good. and just to mention um, something that uh, the WHO is doing on rural equity, um, it's uh, they're they're doing something called a concept called rural proofing to help exactly with these shortages where people don't have um, access to healthcare because they don't have either health facilities or healthcare workers. So then, how can policies be rural proofed? to ensure that um, there is equity in the access and distribution of care. So you can go to their website and look at that. And also um, they've involved uh, Rural Wonka in that, trying to see how do they improve access to rural areas. So I think that issue of shortage speaks to that. So how do our policies ensure that we do not continue having either perceived or real shortages, especially for the rural areas? I think Cynthia also raises a comment, which I asked her to, you know, it's clarify. Um, but it's it's the perception that primary health care is only for poor and rural, and yeah. that and I think this is one of the big problems of UHC, is that the rich seem to think they can duck that they that it, you know poor, that primary health care is poor quality, and I think we need to move away from that. And I think um, you know on the one hand. On the on a uh, you know on the ground, we sort of like Michael talks of. We try to do the best we can to provide care to the poor, but really we need to step back and look at the whole country. Our role as Afro PHC is to shift the mind of governments. Uh, you know, we know that we have to teach you as a young doctor, or you have to teach young doctors how to function without with very little. But we must not accept that as a given. We in Afro PHC need to tell governments, you have the money. We need to do work and to say, where's the money? Where's the people? And how can we help you to structure it so that the outcomes are good? And do research to check, are the outcomes actually being achieved and build up that clarity? So the question for today, and I think that's the key thing that we have to see is, and the conversation is helping some, but I think if in the closing minutes of this workshop, we could just reflect on that is do we go forward with this approach that says we need small teams to deal with small and panel populations where there's a strong direct relationship and that each that we need to look at countries to sit down and look at their public private resources completely and to actually sort of fashion possible scenarios for building this kind of model using the strategic manner strategic purchasing that, that is within their grasp, where there's capacity being built in their financial departments of finance to actually look at this kind of strategic purchasing approach using mixed capitation. So if we can go forward to governments and we can build up good, um, you know, sort of uh, evidence of the value that is being achieved, which means that we're getting good quality outcomes with relatively low costs and show them through either cases that we have or research that we do, to me, this is what we need to get together. So I think um, we need to find ways in which we can address all the problems like Elias has raised the African power paradox, um, you know, to say this should not be happening. If we have a whole of society approach, uh, uh, you know, the, the principles of universal coverage are to get the full population covered with uh, uh, you know, services, which is as much as possible and as low cost to them as possible. And the fourth element of fourth dimension is with as high quality as possible. So these are the elements that we need to be looking to achieve, um, especially in primary health care. Yes. Thank you so much, um, Prof. Shabir, for um, that great um, summary and uh, reorientation as to what our role is because sometimes we forget that we can actually step in and do something about the issues that we're seeing. So I'm not seeing any more um, raised hands at the moment. Um, so I'm going to assume we do not have any more contributions, but Prof Shabir has placed his contacts um, on the chat. So please feel free to reach out to him with any more thoughts, any more comments on our discussion today or uh, PHC in general. 
Um, so feel free to reach out to him and send out your comments. And um, I think we are coming uh, to the close of the workshop. And I just want to say thank you for everyone who has joined today because you are Afro-PHC, you make up Afro-PHC and you've made this workshop happen with your contribution, with your time and also just um, encouragements and also sharing and collaborating with each other during the workshop. So thank you very much. And um, another a great thank you to Prof Shabir and Prof Roberts in absentia for giving us your time and your experience. And um, also Prof Shabir for uh, uh, organizing these workshops because they are really a great place for people to come and uh, share and exchange ideas. So thank you very much. And I extend a thank you to the uh, uh, Afro PHC executive coordinating team members who are here, who've also been instrumental in the organization of this workshop. Um, thank you very much. Yes. And um, so um, I, I believe Prof. Shabir has also shared a link where you can find uh, the presentations and also uh, the recording will be, will be, will be uh, uploaded to the Afro PHC website. Feel free to go there and uh, listen to the recording for those who missed uh, the first part of the presentation. And also if you're not a member of Afro PHC, you can also go to um, the website. There's a link there for you to register so that you can become part of this great community. And with that, I want to wish everyone a great afternoon yeah, um, and a great evening. I'll call you back if you can call uh, me back in a bit. Stay safe, and we will see you next month on our next workshop. So feel, yeah, feel free to. <laughs> bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Just go Thank to the you. Afro PNC website, Google Afro PNC, and you'll see the the link right on the, you know, on the front page. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.